for being with us on a Saturday morning. I hope you can hear as well. Um, there's a lot of noise around in the pavilion, but I think uh, if I get closer to my mic, uh, so everyone please try to do that, uh, you will understand as well. So good morning and welcome to this great, uh, let's call it health pavilion, and, and to this event that we have called a health check for the Paris Agreement, um, because we are talking about the global stock take. Um, so I'm going to give like a very, very, very brief introduction, and then I will pass to three great presentations, and we can have a discussion after that. Uh, first of all, my name is Anna. I work for a think tank called IGRI, and I work specifically on the global stock take. That's why I'm moderating today. Um, and I will start by saying something that I think you all know, because we are in the health pavilion, but it's that the, the, the Paris Agreement has been named as the biggest agreement on health of this century. And that's why we're linking climate and health today here. Um, so we are trying to look at how we can achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement in a way that they also have this health lens. So they provide health and well-being for communities. They uh, unleash the benefits or the co-benefits that uh, climate action can have for health. And on that, the global stock take is a very relevant mechanism. If you know, the global stock take is this very crucial part of the ratcheting up mechanism of the, of the Paris Agreement, the way that we will look at how we are more ambitious collectively, at how we increase international cooperation. Um, and that can have a lot of health implications, um, as, as, as we will see through the, through the event today. Um, what I find really, really, really interesting of the global stock take is that, and I was just telling the panelists before, um, it has some approaches that you don't normally find in the, in the space of the NFCCC in general. Sometimes it's cross-cutting, sometimes it can look at specific systems, so we had a specific table discussing health in one of the sections of the global stock take. So I hope we can think of ways that this stock take that will end next year, so we have still a year for that, that uh, this stock take gives clear signals also on health of, uh, for the countries to then go back to their countries and, and do their homework on how to like, increase ambition and, and cooperation, and we can see a bit how to do that uh, through today. So as, as I was saying, we will have this three brief presentations, and I'll be introducing each of the speakers when, when they have to speak. Um, but I will start with the first one in my left, which is Josefina Kovian. She's a senior associate with Climate Works and co-manages the Independent Global Stock Take Initiative. I think she will tell us more about that. But she will also help us understand the broad messages that came out of this first week. So during this first week of COP, we had some bits of the global stock take, and she will um, give a bit, a bit of summary if, if you we didn't have time to attend or to follow it all. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Anna, and thank you to the organizers for, for this invitation. So um, I will try to uh, walk us all through what is the global stock take um, and how the global stock take is uh, interacting with different sectors, and in this case, uh, the, the health um, area. So I, I have a, um, a few slides, uh, particularly just with uh, some, some timeline, so I will um, direct you to the slides. Uh, so the global, um, well, first I'm, I'm part of the IGSC, the Independent Global Stock Take, which uh, to start I want to make the clarification that that doesn't mean that we're doing a separate stock take that is independent. It's just the, the Independent Global Stock Take is a platform that looks to uh, elevate the topic of the stock take. So if we can go to the uh, first slide. And, and this is just what I was saying. The IGSC uh, was created uh, around two years ago by um, Climate Works Foundation as a way to bring together different analysts, uh, advocates, campaigners to advocate together for a robust and strong stock take. And I think it's important to mention that this is the first global stock take that the Paris Agreement process has, right? So this is, you know, the, the first time that this is happening. And I think one of the, uh, the things that uh, 
Climate Works and, and, and the founders of the IGST saw as, as very important is to highlight that this is a two-year process. It is not something that comes out uh, you know, magically in, in 2023 at the end, but it is a, a two-year process, a very involved process. Uh, where, as Anna said, there's uh, involvement from non-party stakeholders, which I, I think is like, um, one, of, one of the few spaces of the UNFCCC where that can happen. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so the Global Stock Dig um, got uh, created as part of the Paris Agreement uh, as the mechanism that will help the Paris Agreement. Uh, get to where it should be and increase ambition. So we know that the Paris Agreement is based on nationally determined contributions, which are the NDCs, and those are voluntary, right? Like countries uh, decide what they want to put forward and they put their, their, their voluntary contributions. So the idea of the stock dig is like, if we are all going to be doing voluntary contributions, then we get together, we take an assessment of where we are, uh, then we assess where we need to be in terms of the, the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and then from there, the idea is this is going to feed into countries that can take more ambitious uh, commitments, uh, then go back and, of course, do implementation, because that is where the, the goal is report back and then we have another stock take. So this is the first one of the stock takes that are uh, a mechanism intended to happen every five years uh, for this. And so, uh, so as I mentioned, the global stock take will take stock of the three goals of the Paris Agreement. The first one is on, on mitigation. So where, where are we in terms of, of, of the paths and are we on a safe level of emissions? The second one is on adaptation. Like how are we doing in terms of um, adjusting to those impacts that are, well, some of those are not going to be able to, to disappear with mitigation, but there's already a lot of impacts happening. So how do we adapt to that? And the third, of the, third one of those goals is do we have the finance that we need to, to get to that area. So that is the means of implementation. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. So uh, as I was uh, saying at the beginning, the global stock take is, is a two-year process. It started at, at COP last year on this first phase called information collection and preparation. So, so that first phase is, is technical. It is gathering all the, the information that there's out there. Um, someone was asking before, like, what happens with the IPCC report? Well, that is part of the information uh, collection and preparation phase. And it feeds into this uh, technical assessment phase. So um, the global stock take, one, one of the things is like it should um, assess in terms of the best available science. I think that is uh, one very important point. The best available science needs to be there. And the other is in light of equity. So there needs to be a strong equity component, which uh, it, it is not often a, a word uh, used in, in, the, in the negotiations, but that, that should be part of the assessment. Uh, so we have these three phases. Right now we are in the phase number two, and I can go a little bit more into detail um, later in the presentation. And phase number three is uh, this uh, political phase that is happening uh, mid-year, starting mid-year um, 2023. Um, yes, so uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So in terms of how uh, effective uh, effective stock take will look like. We have these three different areas. It should set, uh, set the pace for, for countries to act. Uh, it should drive ambitious uh, climate action and support. And I, and I think more than, and there's of course this part of, of uh, feeding into the NDCs and increasing uh, the ambition in NDCs, but it has to be um, base and, and action and implementation. So I think a successful stock take will also give some best practices for countries to uh, act on. Um, and then it should provide guidance, which I think is, is where, uh, well, this is where we are in, in terms of uh, the, the Paris Agreement goals. How do we get there is the part where best practices um, can come in. Uh, and finally, provide uh, accountability. This is not strictly an accounting process. There, there are other uh, processes of the IGST, I mean, um, I'm sorry, of the UNFCCC that do this accounting. 
So there, there are processes, uh, the enhanced transparency framework and, and other um, measures that are keeping um, countries accountable, but I think more as a significant process, knowing that they have civil society um, watching, that we have different sectors and, and different communities t paying attention to the global stock take sends a signal of accountability. And if we can go next slide. So with all of this, uh, the independent global stock take, as, as I mentioned, is not exactly intending to do uh, its own like process, but we're just uh, aiming to elevate the topic. So this is um, a process that started uh, last year. So calling, calling attention to the process, I think, is, is, is one of the important parts. And next slide. Great, so this is uh, overall the structure of the IGSC. We work with four thematic groups that are aligned uh, with the three goals of the Paris Agreement, uh, mitigation, adaptation, uh, finance, and there's one cross-cutting, which is in equity. Uh, we work uh, uh, with regional engagement and, and we have different hubs. We started with a pilot in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and now this year we um, started a new um, hub in West Africa and Southeast Asia. So the idea is through those hubs, uh, we can engage civil society to participate in, in, the, in the stock tick. Uh, and we have different partners, IDRI is one of them, and, uh, and, uh, and a lot others that can um, that work under this umbrella of the IGST. Uh, next slide. Great, so we go back to the timeline, and so G GST open at uh, the last COP. Right now we are in where the, where the star is in that timeline, uh, around the second technical dialogues. Um, we had the first technical dialogues back in, in Bonn in June, so there was already some, some lessons to learn for, um, uh, from for, for all the parties. And at this moment, one of the things that um, a lot of uh, non-party st stakeholders are highlighting from this second uh, technical dialogues is that there have been a lot more open uh, participation in the round ta tables has been uh, open for everybody. You can, or well, it concluded yesterday, so you were able to go sit on the tables and and. Um, uh, participate in very specific um, topics. So, so I think that was great and there were um, a lot of lessons already implemented from that. What is coming next? Um, there is a, a first a summary of all the round tables, uh, all the technical dialogues, the second one coming out, uh, I think perhaps in, in, in a month from the, from the co-facilitators of, of the dialogues and then the preparation for the third technical dialogue and then the political phase. Um, I think it is important to mention that um, this is the first global stock take happening. So there's a lot of things that have been defined about how a stock take can look like, but there's still a lot of things that should be defined in, in the next month. So I think that's where there's opportunity for different organizations, for civil society to um, go and, and push for what we want to, to be in, in the stock tick. Um, and, I, and I think we can get more into, in, into details and the, in, in, in the questions. But finally, just to say that the political phase is the one that is supposed to like, have this, this uh, strong calling for countries to uh, go back into, into action and implementation. So I'll finish with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Safina. That was very a very good summary. I hope uh, you have uh, great questions for her later on. Um, and you were talking about uh, best practices and, and how to bring them uh, at the Global Stock Take and so on as well. And that's why I think it's a nice segue to talk to uh, Marina Romanello. She's the executive director of the Lancet Countdown. And she will be talking a bit about what the Lancet Countdown has been doing on, on indicators for monitoring progress, uh, in this case in health. And, and maybe we can bring this to the Global Stock Take and the type of monitoring that's supposed to, to do as well. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you for everyone that was brave enough to come here on a Saturday morning. Really appreciate you being here. 
Um, if we can have the slides up, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about um, what the Lancet Countdown has been doing and why we're talking about a health tech for the Paris Agreement, why we think the health should be central to this. Um, while the slides are up, I'll just speak. So, um, as you've heard, the global stock take is meant to monitor progress and then drive ambition towards delivering the goals of the Paris Agreement. And you must have heard over and over, particularly, next slide please, in this pavilion about what health, uh, climate change means for health. Uh, in 2009, um, the, the first Lancet Commission on Climate Change and Health concluded that climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. And at the same time, the WHO reached the exact same conclusion. And that is perhaps um, some of the strongest wording that you can ever have about global health. The biggest global health threat of the 21st century it cannot get much worse than that. And then in 2015, just six years later, a second commission was published that concluded that it's not only the biggest global health threat of the century, but also tackling climate change could be the biggest global health opportunity of the 21st century. And that is where the health community is putting so much focus in ensuring that actually that opportunity is delivered. Next slide, please. And we have a, a brilliant global thinker, um, a scientist, and I would say a, a brilliant philosopher called Dermot Campbell-Endrum that is sitting just to my left. Um, <laughs> that in 2015, when the Paris Agreement came out, they said precisely what, what Hannah was highlighting, that it could be potentially the most important public health agreement of the century. And I will stress the word potentially, because there's potential to make that happen. There's also the potential that that does not get delivered. And that is why we're having that conversation today. Next slide, please. So for those of you that know us, uh, we've been sitting in this room for a few talks, so I'm sorry if I'm uh, repeating myself, but we're the Lancet Countdown, and we're basically a very big collaboration. Next slide, please. Um, bringing together about um, 100 collaborating institutions around the world. Uh, all in all, we have about 300 people that actively contribute to the Lancet Countdown's global teams and regional teams. And our goal is to bring together the best available science, uh, science the best available scientists, and leading uh, UN agencies and uh, academic institutions to collect evidence and monitor progress against health and climate change. So it's a big open collaboration that tries to nucleate what the health community is doing and beyond what others are doing that pertains to the health community in terms of tracking progress on health and climate change. Next slide, please. So on a yearly basis, we've been publishing these uh, reports in the Lancet Medical Journal. I don't need to probably introduce the Lancet to this particular audience. Um, but these annual iterations of the reports have over 40 indicators that monitor both the health impacts of climate change and the health benefits of climate action. And we call the Lancet Countdown tracking progress on health and climate change. And the Lancet Countdown was established just after the Paris Agreement was signed, when we were all so excited about how much progress we were going to do since, and our countries committed to self-determining their contributions, and we were all going to be friends and do this together heroically. Um, and last year we, meet, uh, we reached record emissions. So what we've been monitoring in our reports is, by and large, increasing health impacts of climate change and the enormous opportunity of climate action and that, what, what that could look like for health, both in terms of avoiding these impacts and in delivering on the health co-benefits of climate action, which by and large look like very sensible public health interventions that would deliver cleaner air, healthier diets, cleaner cities, active travel, uh, more resilient health systems and health relevant systems. Next slide, please. So our global reports um, are global. They have global coverage. Um, in general terms, global coverage is really informative for these discussions for our global stock take, but we all know that policymakers and action actually needs to know what is happening on the ground at a local level. So over the past years, we've been putting our efforts in opening regional centers in key areas around the world. There's a few areas they're missing, and as soon as we have more capacity, we'll open those as well. But the idea of these centers is that they will look a bit deeper into what the health impacts of climate change at the local level are, and what the health opportunities of climate action look like, and particularly what can be implemented and what can the different regions do, what they need in order to protect health from, from climate change. And I think there is where it gets really interesting in terms of equity. When we talk about health, that is where the broader inequities are felt and where uh, health represents the human dimensions 
of all the impacts of climate change and all the um, increased inequities that we're seeing as a result of it. And having these regional centers has allowed us to explore just how different the, the, the impacts and the opportunities are at a regional level and just how important it is to keep these different uh, lenses into account. Next slide, please. So all of our regional centers, global team as well, um, we take the same approach. We look at the changing impacts or climate determined risks to health of, of um, climate change. And that allows us to monitor where adaptation needs to happen. And in the cases where we can measure impacts, whether that adaptation is reducing those impacts or not. We also look specifically at adaptation. I'm sure Jeremy is going to talk a bit about that because the WHO is the big data collector for um, progress on adaptation and understanding what countries are doing or not doing in terms of adapting to the health um, hazards and the health impacts of climate change. We also look at mitigation. And when we look at mitigation, we want to put the focus in understanding that when we talk about greenhouse gas emissions, we talk about a hazard to health, a direct hazard to health. And above everything, that when we talk about mitigation, we're not only avoiding that hazard, but also, as I said, delivering on these enormous co-benefits. So we have data that allows us to understand what are the impacts of air pollution on health, of unhealthy diets, and just how many lives we could be saving by putting health at the center of that transition towards lower carbon, healthier food, um, energy, and in general, social systems. And then we look at economic transition as well. And I think that is where it gets really interesting because the global stock take and the, the Paris Agreement in general mentions economics, I don't know how many times, but I think every other paragraph you have a mention to economics. And there's a lot of focus in the economic dimension of, cl of climate change and what the Paris Agreement is to do in terms of protecting economies. But health is barely mentioned. So we're monitoring progress against protecting our infrastructure and our economies and not really about protecting our people. So that is where we put the economic components of the climate conversation in the context of health. And just under the understanding that the economics impacts undermine the socioeconomic determinants of health that are a fundamental cornerstone of our health and well-being. So putting this in the context of what it means for health can help us better reflect what the impacts of the Paris Agreement are and how we can ensure that ultimately the Paris Agreement just becomes the biggest global health treaty of the 21st century. Um, next slide, please. I think that's the last one. Yeah, there you go. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Marina. I think uh, it was very interesting because you're pointing out things that anyway, they are also being discussed in the global stock take and they can easily fit in on like, how do we monitor this? How do we make it better? How do we give signals? So that's, that's super interesting. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass to the last speaker. Um, so we have Dermot Campbell-Landrum that we just have also quoted in the last uh, presentation. Uh, he's the head of climate um, and health program at the World Health Organization. And he's going to be speaking about uh, a framework to measure the, the benefits of, of climate action. So the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks very much, and, and thanks for an, an introduction I will never be able to live up to. That is, <laughs> try, try telling my children that, that I, am, I am those things. I, I should also say it's, it's actually based on false pretenses. Um, I, I, I do say that a lot, but I don't think I'm the originator of it. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I get quoted for it because I, I, I do say it a lot. The, the quote about, um, yeah, the Paris Agreement being potentially the uh, the greatest public health agreement of the 21st century is one of our our lines uh, from from WHO that we've consistently said. Um, I, I think there's a couple of important lessons. One is, I think uh, it's amazing how much you can get done if you don't care too much who takes the credit for it. So the more that people get that uh, that answer, that headline out there, I think the better um, better off we are, and we don't care if the Lancet says it, or we say it, or, or somebody else uh, says it. And that, that's one of the lessons that we wanted to take about collaboration and the, and the fact that we think that at WHO, we think that in the climate and health community, we're pretty coherent and pretty mutually supportive around the same lines, whether it's Lancet saying it, or, or, or we're saying it, or, or GCHA, or, or, or anybody else. 
Um, I would say just on that quote, it's probably slightly dangerous because the one person I, I think actually originated it is my boss. So I need to be a little bit careful. She's lovely. I mean, she won't kill me for it. But, but uh, if you're going to attribute it to anybody, attribute it to either to Maria or to her boss because there's, no, uh, there's no harm in doing that. I think um, I was really looking forward to, to this session because I was really interested to learn more about the global stock take. There aren't that many people in the world who you know, really want to get into the, the minutiae of the, the UNFCCC uh, processes. You, you, you people do it. Thanks for doing it for, so the rest of us usually don't have to. But it, it is critically important that we understand some of these key UNFCCC processes. Because from the health point of view, um, over the, the past couple of decades now that we've been building up the, the evidence and building up the arguments and the community on climate change and health, and that's expressed so well here by this pavilion, the second time we've had a pavilion, best pavilion in the, um, uh, in the, uh, in the COP, no doubt about it, but the, uh, also best people in the COP come here. But as we built that up around the, the margins of the negotiations, we perhaps, we feel that we took a little bit of our eye, started to take our eye off the ball a little bit on the negotiations. We used to do more of that when there were fewer of us, didn't have so much of a, of a sideshow. And so we do need to make sure that we're informed and can feed in this massive capacity and mobilization that we now have on the, uh, on the health and climate side to, to feed in. And unusually within the negotiations, we genuinely think we're here to help because in general, within the negotiations, there's either passive resistance or a little bit of active pushback to everybody who wants to get their agenda on the negotiations because it's a very difficult process. We have all sympathy for the negotiators and people dealing uh, with this. They're trying to combat, to fix the greatest challenge humanity has ever seen. They've tried to make it as simple as possible. You need to get the carbon out of the atmosphere. You need to adapt. You need to finance that. You need to work together. They don't want additional complications that don't help them to do that job. And we should not be in the business of giving them additional complications to, to, the, uh, to, to them doing their job. But the reason that we think that we can help is because we do have masses of evidence on this. And some of the words I was taking away from the, the, uh, the, the first presentation around raising ambition. Everybody wants to raise ambition. Um, we know there's an issue about finance, and, and probably the, the biggest general argument against action on climate change is, well, it costs money. So can we afford it? Is it can we generate the investment? And can we get public support in order to back up ambitious commitments? Health can genuinely help on all of those because people care about their health. We have the most trusted advocates from, uh, come from the health uh, community. We do have really strong evidence. And, and much of the evidence that we have relates directly to, to those issues. So Marina was just describing that, you know, the strong work on economics within the, uh, the Lancet countdown that's, you know, it's captured very well there. There's other you know, work going on uh, around economics. And some of the headlines that we have on health and economics that relate to the global stock take is, you probably all, all know this, but if you value the health benefits that would come from meeting the Paris goals, just from air quality alone, if you put any sensible value on those health gains, they more than pay for the cost. They're bigger than what it costs to fix climate change. So that should be the kind of thing that gets taken into account and feeds into the, uh, into the negotiations. You know, we, we see that um, another, a, a related way of putting that is that in the Glasgow, um, uh, the, the, the final agreement in, in Glasgow, there was finally reference to to coal, to, to fossil fuels, and phasing out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Again, you may be aware of the figures, but the direct financial subsidies are about $400 billion a year. That's effectively almost paid in cash to, to prop up uh, fossil fuels. If you take into account the health externalities, if you value the health damages that come from burning the fossil fuels, there's a big, quite a big uncertainty around that number. But if you do that, the IMF estimates that's five point, I think it's almost up to six trillion dollars a year that they say is an effective subsidy to the fossil fuel industry because you're not valuing either the lives that are lost or you're not valuing it e economically. And, and yet that doesn't fit into the calculus. It doesn't, it doesn't get captured anywhere, even though that's, I think that's getting on for 10% of the global economy. 
that number is more than all governments around the world spend on their health systems. It's a massive number. It's a crazy situation that we are paying in cash, we're paying in our lungs at a much bigger value than actually fixing the climate problem. So we, we sort of sit here on the margins of the negotiation saying we've got you know, the best evidence, we've got the best arguments, so on and so forth. And yet it really matters that we know the processes within the negotiations because it's very easy for us to just sail on by talking to the, ourselves and maybe the rest of the world saying crazy situations needs to be fixed and it not actually penetrating the negotiations not because people don't think it's important but they have an agenda it's a difficult agenda and unless you get the hooks in then they effectively think well it's somebody else's business or you're coming to us too late so we have, and we have a bit of a sad history of, of, of that in, in health. We should have picked up this issue right from the start of the, uh, in, in better in 1992. So the, the overarching agreement across the environmental conventions, including the, the climate convention, Article 1 describes health. It's one of the things that, that the whole, that all of this and all the other conventions should be trying to protect. Health is right, is right up there. It's in... Um, yeah, it's in the, the principles of what we're, the, the agreement tries to achieve. The right to health is in the Paris Agreement. Um, Article 4.1.F in the Convention asks countries to take account of the health implications of the decisions they take. So the hooks are there, at the, uh, but we, have been, we had been late in coming to the negotiations, engaging patiently, sympathizing with the negotiators to, to get those in. So that's why this process stuff is really important to us because if we turn up in nine months time with a brilliant report from the Lancet Countdown and, and other stuff we can do and say, oh, here's, here's, you know, here's the health answer. Unless we've done the preparatory work over the course of the year, they'll say, fantastic, but it's, it's too late for this. So it will be good. I'm really looking forward to the discussion to, to make sure that we can engage. We do have um, possibilities uh, of engaging, um, including signals from the, the incoming presidency. Um, you know, they're scoping out their agenda, but they're asking about health, they're indicating interest in health, they're mentioning the global stock take. So I think it's sort of the onus is on us in this room and, and those of us who have capacity to work on this issue like Lance Account and ourselves, but also uh, other analytical agencies that have more direct experience in the negotiations, people who can talk about fossil fuel subsidies, doing those analyses and so on, to really get to grips with this process, to really inform ourselves so that we can make sure we're intervening in the right way um, at the right time. I'll just say one final word about one of the things that we're bringing to this. So those figures I was giving at the beginning about the money that gets wasted on um, fossil fuel subsidies and so on. We we'd look at this situation and, th and, and it is crazy. I mean, it's, 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 I've been quoting this for the last couple of months. It's 30 years since the US election, which Bill Clinton won on with the, the focus. It's the economy stupid. And now we're at 30 years later, we are in the stupid economy. If we are spending that amount of money directly in cash and in our lungs and in the impacts of climate change and impacts on health, which is the thing we, we care most about, that's crazy and we have the evidence for it and we can you know, we can put all of that together and put really eloquent people up to tell you why it, it uh, why it matters and it's the process thing that we have to get fixed one of the contributions we're making in this area is that we had seen that we hadn't been very good about putting climate environment sorry climate health and economics together so we see these headlines we to be honest engage with them in a slightly superficial way we we basically say, look, you know, big numbers, it's crazy, and then, but don't have the capacity to, to then work it through. So we're just publishing a framework to, which uh, has, includes the health expertise, but includes economists who actually know what makes sense in economic language and so on. So that, I think it's, we're, we're final production, I don't think it's quite on our website, but we'd, we'd like just to highlight that because we think it's a good way of structuring our thinking. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to the discussion to make sure we can hit this process constructively and supportively, but at the right time in the right way. Thank you. Thank you, Diarmid. That's, that's very interesting. And I think uh, let's, let's do as you're suggesting and move to the, to the discussion. I have a, 
some questions prepared, but I will also check the appetite of the public. Um, let me launch the first, first, first one, which is very basic, um, but then we can kickstart with that. Um, because you were like, we have to understand the process so we can engage with it and, and like get deep into it. Also, inserting health in, in this global stock take the year and triple C in general. So my first basic question is like, seeing the interventions, having understood a bit better the global stock take, how do we want it to look next year? There's, there's both the more technical part that uh, Josefina was explaining, but there's also the more like political outcomes what are our like best hopes uh, for it so we can then work towards them? So I'm, I'm opening with that and then we just move to the public. Whoever wants to react first, uh, you can go. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. Okay. Um, great, so I, I think there's, there's a big opportunity in, in the global stock take um, process. And, and I wanna bring in an analogy that um, of course, came out of the of the title of this of this event, which is a health check to the Paris Agreement. So I think in in uh, in, in the global. So <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so so I think that the idea of having a health check of where we are at is, is very important. So this is the moment where we are uh, doing that health check, and, and I think we have heard already. Like we know that there's action missing. We know that there's more that we can be doing. So I think we have to move from that into like, okay, and after you go to the doctor, then you know what's wrong. And then you have to talk about the best practices. You have to talk about, okay, how do I solve this problem? How do I get ahead of it? You know, do I have to like walk my 10,000 steps a day? Do I have to eat healthy? So I think that's where we need to go. In the in at the country level and at the national level, and and as you were saying, like action happens at the local level. So I think that's where we that's where we need to go. You know, like focus the global stock take and focus the conversations on what we do, not focus the conversations on everything. You know, everything's going wrong. Well, okay, yes, we know, uh, and now it's time to act on how to make it better. So. Thank you. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I think we also have to be a bit clearer um, about what, wh where we want to go. What does success look like for the Paris Agreement? Um, and having a bit of a clearer understanding of the potential that countries have in terms of delivering on health benefits, of protecting health, can allow us to then tailor the stock take to be able to capture that and then feed back into the NDCs for next year to also incorporate. We have done an analysis in Lancet Count on how many NDCs mention health, but GCHA has done a very detailed analysis of the extent to which uh, health is taken into account across different work streams in the, in the NDCs. And it's, it's not much, it's not there so present as we think it should be to make it um, the biggest um, uh, global health treaty of the 21st century. So how do we better tailor the discussion? How do we focus on what the opportunities are such that when we go evaluate and increase ambition, that ambition is tailored towards protecting people, protecting our health, protecting our future, aside from protecting everything else that determines what our future looks like. Thanks. I, I, I I'll just basically support those comments. And I, I think that point about the global stock take and a health check on the global stock take shouldn't just be, I mean, we know it's going to be bad. We, and yeah, the Lancet countdown has, uh, has, has told us that. We, we know across the board that the news is not, is not going to be good. And there are two sort of attitudes, I think, that the health community brings to this, which I, again, I think can help. One is that amongst the health community, usually when we see a bad situation, I mean, in this environment, you have a lot of people turning up saying, oh, this is, you know, things are terrible. You know, you guys need to do something about it. That's generally not the attitude of the health community. You know, you don't get a patient coming in, you know, with an emergency, so oh, this kid looks terrible. Somebody should fix it. No, you, you, you step up and try and do, do what you can. The other thing is that you don't, no ethical doctor gives a diagnosis without a prescription to do whatever you can about it. So as we do that health check, it should be, there should, as you say, be a direct link to, okay, this is what we need. And, and I would say also, 
again, what we can do to actually volunteer what we can do to help, not just saying, you know, it's terrible, something should be done, and you people should sort it out. We can say that, but we should also say, okay, and here's how health is going to step up in order to do, uh, to do its bit to genuinely help. Okay, thanks for helping me kickstart the discussion. Uh, so I know there was already a question there. Oh, and then you can, oh, you can pass the microphone. I, I was asked if you can stand up while you ask your question. Hi, good morning, everyone. I don't know if I should ask this question through the medium of song. It might be, uh, we could do a sing-off here, but perhaps I'll move on from that thought. My name is Colin, I'm from Ireland. I think it's a really interesting discussion, and I think there's a, it's a very strong kind of an existential question for health in this space going forward under Paris. And I suppose one particular thought I had is if you look at Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, everyone's familiar with 2.1a, which is the one and a half degrees. 2.1b is mitigate the hell out of this thing. Um, adapt, I mean. And then I suppose 2.1c is perhaps one of the least discussed elements of it. And I think particularly touching on Dermot's points around fossil fuel subsidies, etc. If you look at 2.1c, which seeks to make finance flows compatible with low emission and carb climate resilient development, you can look at that like it's something that needs to be explored further. And it's something that there's been a lot of countries looking to bring that out further here. And it'll be interesting to see what happens next year. But you can look at that in the context of how much money is made available for climate action. You can also look at that in terms of global finance flows and which ones are not consistent with the Paris Agreement, like we touched on with the fossil fuel subsidies. And I think in the same way that, you know, I suppose mitigation is probably the easiest one to track progress on because you have the numbers, you know where the emissions are going. Adaptation is a little bit trickier, but there's a lot of work going into that here. But there's still a little bit of a question mark around how do you track progress in making global finance flows compatible with low carbon and climate resilient development. And I think it would be very interesting, I suppose, to see if there's any thoughts on whether this is something that the health sector could explore or you know, encourage the exploration of at the next COP and going forward. Thanks. Hi, um, Jenny Miller, Global Climate and Health Alliance. Um, and I think my question is primarily for Josefina, but would love to hear other thoughts as well. Uh, and it's getting a little bit into the weeds, as, as you all were talking about. Um, in February of this year, GCHA uh, made a submission to the global stock take. It was pretty fast and dirty. Um, we wanted to get a stake in the ground for health in that process. We followed up in August, and at that point, we were able to actually collaborate with WHO and, and others to do a joint submission that was more thought through. Um, but going forward, I was not familiar with the independent global stock take process. Um, I'm interested in what you see as the work we need to be doing over the coming year to actually make the global stock take a, a health uh, measure. Um, and build health into it, like concretely what, who do we need to be organizing, what parts of the process do we need to be engaging with, and from GCHA's point of view, how can civil society health organizations help? Okay, should we start with those two and then, and then we see uh, if there are more questions, so I'm just going to, yeah. Thank you, and I'm going to start with the last one, which is just uh, top, of, top of mind right now. And I, I think there's uh, the, the submissions part related to, to this technical dialogues. We can get uh, I, I'm very in the weeds and, and very technical about it. How, how that is going to be translated and move into the political phase, I think it is still a big question for, for, a lot, for a lot of us and even for those creating the process. But I think these are the right questions to ask. And, and this is the moment to be asking those questions. Um, I, I, will, I will pass it around and, and, and come back to that a little more. Thank you. Um, just very briefly on, on the finance side of things, um, we already talked a bit about kind of fossil fuel subsidies, which is the thing that we should not be doing. Um, but we're also seeing in many of our 
data that one of the key limitations for implementation of, for example, adaptation plans or development of risk assessments, or particularly from the strengthening of health systems and, and delivery on adaptation goals, the key limitation that countries report is lack of finance. And many countries do need international finance uh, streams to support that happening. Um, particularly we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, health systems were really put to, on their knees and financial support is essential to, uh, to, to allow for that resilience to be built. And without strong health systems, you don't have strong health. And there's no doubt about that, Jesus. Um, so I, I, I would be very curious to um, learn more about how those financial flows can be better monitored. We know about the 100 billion, they have not been delivered. Um, we estimate that just on net subsidies, uh, about 80 countries do 400 billion at least a year. We know that that number is from 2019 that has gone up. So we know that the funds are available. We've seen how much they got, um, they, they were made available uh, all of a sudden during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we know that this is, there's not a lack of funding, it's just that the funding is not being prioritized properly and health is not being put at the center of how we prioritize those resource allocations. So I would be very interested in, in, in hearing more also from others that know more about finance than me. I'm not a, an economist whatsoever. But how we can better um, work to promote the redirection of the funds that are available towards those activities that we know are essential priorities to enable a, a, a survivable future. Yeah, thanks. I, I don't have too much to add because that's the kind of question we would also uh, seek to you know, be informed on over the next couple of weeks so that we, we don't, uh, don't miss the boat. I think part of the thinking that we need to do as well is to have, go in with quite an open and imaginative mind about how we frame these issues. I mean, on, on just to take that example, the, the, the finance issue, you know, it's been however long it is now that, that the world has been coming to this conference saying we need the 100 billion, the 100 billion's not turning up, it, and it still hasn't turned up. That, that's really bad, that money should, should come, but it's also important to bear in mind that's not a lot of money, you know, in, in the global scheme of things, you know, if we're paying much more than that directly in fossil fuel subsidies, we can't entirely be distracted by go and argue over this 100 billion where we're still you know, spending trillions on uh, on other things which you know, don't contribute to this uh, this goal. So, I we have to be smart about it, about what fits into the different processes. But I, I mean, when we talk about finance flows, again, it shouldn't just just be what money is flowing through the GCF and why isn't it coming to health, which is an issue. But it's that's a sort of a ten a share of a ten billion dollar question, where where you know financial investment in new exploration in oil and gas when it's pretty clear we shouldn't be exploring new oil and gas is hundreds of billions presumably is that considered within the finance thinking and if it is if it if it can be related to the in within the global stock take we should maybe argue for that if it can't then we should also be talking that's where we have to decide what we do through the negotiations and what we do else outside because we should be talking about that and um, if it can't be driven through the negotiations either because it doesn't fit the structure or or countries don't want to hear it within the, the stock take well that's where we have the independent civil society voice and the the impartial evidence from academics and so on to, to make it part of the, the 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 wider conversation about how we spend money and not just the 100 billion or the uh, or the 10 billion and just to make a, a quick plug into in the, the finance question the finance working group of the independent global stock take has been working particularly on case studies of how uh, finance in different countries is actually aligned with with the Paris Agreement goals and and this like uh, alignment of overall finance. So um, you you can yeah check check those and happy to to give you more more information on that. And um, just quickly to cook, to go back to the question of um, how how we can be more engaged through to the process. There's still a lot of things to be defined. But I think what we can aim for is that the global stock take can be more of a momentum too, right? Like, and, and going back to the, to the health analogy, when you go to the doctor, you have that momentum to then act on things, right? Then uh, to, to make healthy choices, to make healthy decisions. So I think that's kind of a, 
even if if uh, you know the, the the diplomatic process, the negotiations get get blurry and get specific, the world can definitely take this global stock take process as a momentum to to act. Thanks. That's a that's a great statement. Do, do we have any more questions from the floor that we can take before we finish the event? Or anyone wanted to follow up with anything they said? Not for now. Okay. Um, is there anything else uh, we would want to add? I did have prepared um, some more questions, but I also think that sometimes an idea came up that you wanted to share or something like this, and it's uh, good to allow that to happen. Did you? Oh no, no. I. <laughs> I think. Uh, I think I'm fine. But uh, if you wanted to add anything else on on the discussion, just in general on on this interlinkage that we have been having to be trying to build between the UFCCC process, the GST, and health, um, now it's time to either ask a last question or just have a live statement. You you want to? Yeah, perfect. No, just one comment um, that. We've been seeing health getting a bit more space in the negotiations, and we've been seeing health being mentioned more and more, and that has to do with collective work from the WHO, from civil society, and from others. And now we have, in the Global Stock Takes, also discussions around health. We know that next year they might be interested also in mainstreaming health into some of these conversations as well. And we have been discussing quite a lot in terms of what, what, what do we want the Paris Agreement for, if it's to protect, again, our financial systems, our infrastructure and economy, or if it is to protect people and our health. And I think, uh, probably I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but health is the ultimate determinant of our well-being. Without good health, we don't have good livelihoods, we don't have good well-being, and we don't have good lives. So it's the thing that we should be protecting the most. And the fact that that has so far not been at the center stage of the climate change conversations, when our future is at stake, is to me a bit of a mystery. So just to highlight the role of the, the health community uh, as a collective in, in pushing towards making that happen and how important it is to have a, a pavilion and to have the visibility of, of the health sector and particularly of the WHO taking a stand here and uh, putting really the, the, the health arguments at the center of the discussions have been enormous. So thank you to everyone in this space and to WHO. Thanks. No, I, again, I couldn't agree more with, with all of that. I, I was also thinking may, maybe the, the final thought that I would have on this is exactly how we move forward now, given that you know, we always say you know, climate change in general is urgent, but this is, this is particularly urgent because, again, if we go off amongst ourselves and do our own thing and turn up later with a brilliant report and, and the negotiator said, fine, but uh, you, know, you should have sent us that six months ago, then we will have missed the boat. So, I think, um, yeah, it, it would be good. We don't, you know, we're not probably not going to do it here, or, you know, with uh, with a mic, but to to make sure that we are as well organised as we possibly can be across the different stakeholders that you need in order to inform this process. So, if I'm lining up the players, we have a COP presidency which seems to have at least an open ear, if not an open door, to to health in the. Um, in the global stock take. We do have some interested uh, national delegations who we think would be supportive of this, we think, so we should try and convene those. We, as WHO, you know, we have a, some seat at the, uh, the table as a UN agency, a bit of an interlocutor. Um, not as prominent, of course, as the member states, as are the parties, they're the ones that really drive the process. Um, we have you know, really good evidence, we have, you know, good, um, academic evidence summaries. We have civil society organizations and analysts who do know the negotiation process, who can help with different parts of that. And then we have uh, civil society, org an organized civil, um, GCHA, an, an organized health civil society who can, act, who can also mobilize voices to talk about this uh, more generally. I mean, it's, it, it sounds a bit weird that you would get like a doctor or no, nurse saying, uh, Global stock take for the UNF Triple C, but but it you know it, it's not completely crazy that that pe people it it's it's not much more crazy than you know doctors and nurses getting out and demonstrating and getting themselves 
locked up because they feel about this, to, to step out of their comfort zone and say, well, you don't expect this from us, but we, you know, the thing that would really help um, you know, in, in protecting people's health is a really good global stock take that says we're not uh, dealing enough with the Paris Agreement. I, I think we should try and organize a little bit quite quickly so we can deploy all of those strengths uh, as effectively as possible into the global stock take. Thanks. And, and if I can add from, from more an outsider perspective, because I don't work specifically on health, I'm more like in the UNFCCC space, um, I, I, I think you are, you are going in the right direction, right? Like you will need to get into the nitty gritty of this if you want to affect the global stock take. And we heard like submissions are already happening and so on, and there's interest and we're doing an event and so on. Um, but then Josefina also mentioned that at the beginning, and, and you were talking about this now, like the, the more like momentum mobilization part of it is really important because in the end, what will come out of the growth stock take will not only be technical, the most important part will be very political, and that requires a lot of like pressuring and uh, lobbying, if you want to call it this way, talking to the delegations and mobilizing the people on the ground. So I think uh, that's the right directions to start including, uh, or to continue including, because it's already there, uh, the, the health uh, perspective in the global stock take. Um, so I will leave it at that, if there's no more, more oh, I see it as a, Let's stay, can I take the spur of the moment and get the last question? Hi. Oh. Sorry. Hi, uh, Rob Hughes from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I just had a question on that point around the nitty gritty. Um, actually, uh, sort of two questions. One was in this phase of submission of um, documents, is that something where we should, as a health community, be really almost trying to flood the, the secretariat with health evidence, will that, will that work or will that be annoying? Um, and then secondly, in, within the secretariat, thinking about the, the recipients of those submissions, is there any uh, health expertise in the stock take secretariat? And is that, for example, the sort of thing where um, if there were a party that were particularly interested and wanted to, to sort of support that capacity. Because I'm conscious sometimes we speak in a language that isn't always understandable. Um, so both the transmission and the reception of the information feel important. In, in terms of the submissions, I will say yes, flooded, input as much as possible. and. Uh, perhaps the secretary will be best positioned to to answer. You know who who will be there to to actually read and read and process. And and at the end, all the submissions together with the technical uh, dialogues and, and the roundtables uh, come out in a summary. So I I think you know even uh, they're they're counting and they know like oh we had I don't know ten. Um, uh, organizations doing submission so that that signals um, the, the interest of the community Did you want to attend I'd say what it's what it's also useful is that your submissions have a clear message but it could be a summary or like a bullet point or something because they are a bit uh, overwhelmed with so many things and having something that it's like the health community has these messages, or, or one bit of the health community is these, that the other complements with that. I, it, I don't mean you have to like, but um, I think it really helps then being really clear, oh, that's what they want to insert in here. That's how, I don't know, um, concrete. I think we got to a point where the process is getting more and more concrete. I mean, the last cycle, as Josefina was explaining, is in, in the bond session already next year, and that's the end of the technical part. So if we can like be precise, I think they, that's easier for us, I guess, and, and it's also easier for them. So that's a concrete suggestion. Um, I will end it at that. If, yeah, if you, I mean, we can continue the conversation without having a stage and audience uh, in between. Uh, thank you very much for all the questions and for the excellent discussion and presentations. Um, and I hope this continues to spur the moment to work on the interlinkage between health and the global stock take, which makes me very happy particularly, but I think makes very happy everyone in the panel and in this room. So thanks for that and let's continue the work.
morning, everyone. I think we'll start. Thank you very much for your patience and sorry for the delay. We were just waiting for all of our speakers to be online. So first of all, good morning. My name is Kirsten Hagen. Uh, I'm from the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, and I'm really happy to be here with you today. Welcome to our honored guests in person and online. Just so you know, online we have uh, His Honor Christopher Kalila, Member of Parliament in Uganda, um, the Honorable Stephen Newell, also Member of Parliament in Uganda. We also have uh, Viengohan Surio, uh, who's dialing in remotely from the Lao People's Democratic Republic. We have Professor Ibrahim Abubakar, uh, who's uh, the Dean of the UCL Faculty of Population and Health Sciences, and we also have Dr. Ali Adalan, the Regional Advisor at the WHO Regional Office for the Eastern Mediterranean, who are all dialing in remote. And then we have a very exciting panel of, of, of women. I'm liking this change from what we've been seeing in a few other places. A panel of women speakers where we have Masako Ueda, the Regional Migration, Environment and Climate Change Specialist at IOM Regional Office. We also have Dr. Maria Gavoir, the International Medical Secretary for Médecins Sans Frontières, and Ms. Priska Chisala, the Director of Programs and Development at the Mali sorry, at the Malawi Red Cross Society. So welcome everybody. So today's discussion is around climate change, migration, and health. We're gonna talk about these three important and intersecting issues for the next little while. So we all know that climate change poses an imminent and direct threat to people's lives, health, and their well-being. In the past 10 years, some 84% of, of disasters triggered by natural disasters, sorry, disasters triggered by natural hazards were triggered by extreme climate and weather related events, such as floods, storms, heat waves, impacting 1.7 billion people in the last decade. We know that climate change is adversely impacting human health, directly through exposure to hazards and indirectly through natural and socio-economic systems. Current conservative WHO projections estimate that climate change will cause approximately 250,000 deaths per year between 2030 and 2050 from climate-linked communicable and non-communicable diseases, so not including the direct deaths from hazards. Climate change is also displacing millions per year. So communities across the world are already being displaced due to a devastating intersection of climate and weather related events, sea level rise, food insecurity that is also triggered by climate change. So how do these intersect? We're seeing that people have a number of critical needs, some of which are health needs. It can range from psychosocial support, access to clean water and sanitation and emergency shelter. And when you don't have these, there are very obvious health impacts. And they also need uh, to have the critical support in terms of protection and recovery and durable solutions. We also see the overlapping risks of climate and health related shocks. And many of you will have recalled seeing images of people displaced by floods, by landslides, ending up in evacuation shelters in the middle of COVID, struggling with physical distancing, not enough masks and more. These are just two of the examples of where health, climate change and displacement will overlap. So we're first going to go in our panel to the Honourable Stephen Newell MP from the Matungulu constituency in Kenya and Chair of the African Parliamentary TB Caucus who is dialing in remotely. Mr. Newell, are you on the line? Yes, I can hear you. Great. So we wanted to ask you, Mr. Newell, what are the implications of climate change on health from your perspective as a policymaker? And what are some of the key achievements in the African continent? Drawing on your observations, what do you think we can do to better implement global commitments on the ground? Over to you. can't hear. I'm not sure if you're unmuted. Do you want to try again? You were unmuted before and it was perfect, but let's try again. Uh, 
Thank you very much. I believe you can hear me. Hello. You are able to hear me? I think we need a little bit more volume if that's possible from tech support. Uh, Try again, Stephen. All right. Are you able to get me? You are able to hear we me? can hear you now, but do try and speak up as loudly as you can for the people in the room. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, climate change has been a very... Uh, We seem to have frozen. Uh, is that, can we get some assistance from tech support? And if not, I might move on to the speakers in the room. Okay, my apologies, Mr. Hill. We seem to have lost you. While the team tries to get you back, I'm going to move on to some of the other speakers in the room, and I hope that we can get you back in just a second. So my apologies for the tech, uh, tech challenges. So in that case, I'm going to move straight on to Ms. Masako Ueda, the Regional Migration, Environment and Climate Change Specialist at the IOM Regional Office for the Middle East and North Africa. So Masako, can you tell us what are some of the observed health impacts of climate change on migrants and on mobile populations generally in the region? It would be really good if you could share a little bit about how IOM is addressing these health impacts and what you're seeing as some of the opportunities and challenges in effectively addressing the climate change, mig migration and health nexus in the region and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Good morning, everyone. My name is Masako from the IOM Regional Office for Middle East and North Africa. I apologize in advance my voice, um, because I have my, you know, my voice. So I hope you can hear me well. Because uh, what are, uh, what it seems like we've now got two speakers speaking at once. Uh -huh. Mr. Hale, can you, if you can hold on the line, if you can hold on the line, we've just gone to another speaker because we couldn't hear you, and we'll come straight back to you as soon as she's finished. Thank you very much. So thank you so much. So first of all, I would like to thank on behalf of IOM for you know the partners organizing this very important you know event together with IOM International Organization for Migration. This is very timely because now, as you can see throughout the COP, the human mobility topic is really gaining recognition in the climate change discussions. And earlier I was listening to the discussion in a previous session, the health is also gaining a space in the climate change discussion. So bringing together the climate change, migration, health is a very actually timely discussion. So I would like to thank again for cooperating, you know, having this discussion. In terms of the observed impact of climate change on human health, particularly on the mobile population, uh, Christine, you already mentioned about health impact on the displaced population aftermath of the event. And I think many of us also know the slow onset events, how it's impacting on human health. For instance, in the Gulf region, many of the migrant workers are working in the construction sectors. And they are actually very much affected by the heat wave. And this is causing a lot of health impact among the migrant uh, population, particularly in the low-skilled and semi-skilled -sec sectors as well. IOM, we have a migration health division, which provide direct health assistance to the vulnerable migrants as well as displaced population. Uh, can you hear me? <coughs> so through this assistance, We've been observing how migrants who are actually having a journey, you know, moving from the country of origin, country of transit, country of destination, are being affected increasingly by the climate change. But I think as all of us know, it's often very difficult to differentiate this particular health problem the migrant is facing is caused solely because of the climate change. I think we need more evidence, more data, and more studies. But what we believe as IOM is it's very important to address the impact of the, the, the climate change impact on human health on the mobile population in a holistic manner. As Kristen mentioned, the health impact of, of climate change is not only the physical health, but also it's the mental health. 
as well as the reproductive health, especially in the case of women and girls. And we know also communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases affect migrant, um, migrant and po uh, mobile population. The one point that I would also like to note is the specific vulnerability of the mobile population migrants and also displaced population. They already have a pre-existing vulnerability linked to the mobility, especially when their mobility is taking place in an irregular or forced manner. We already talked about displaced populations who are displaced because of disasters. And they actually face a particular challenge in accessing healthcare services because of weakened you know, healthcare system in uh, in the area which are affected by the you know like the disasters. Also, some of those migrants who are moving in irregular status or ex are exposed to that you know like uh, risks of exploitation and abuse, and even actually amount to the trafficking or smuggling as well. So. What we actually advocate from IOM and what we see as an opportunity is that there are a number of frameworks which are now talking about human mobility in the context of climate change. For instance, the Global Compact for Migration. I think many of you know about this global framework, which has a specific objective, which look at the natural disaster, climate change as adverse drivers, which can compel people to move. We also have SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, which talks about the orderly, safe, regular migration as a key target, 10.7. And combined with target 3.8, which is calling for the uni universal health coverage, I think we have a very strong foundation to direct efforts towards incorporating migration health concerns in the climate change policies. Leading up to the COP27, ION organized a South-South Cooperation Symposium on Climate Change, Migration and Health in Morocco, inviting the government representative, civil society representative from North Africa, as well as academia and UN partners. This symposium was important because it's, it was the first time in the North Africa which brought together the health society and also the policymakers who are involved in the climate change coming together to discuss this nexus. And this symposium has resulted in 13 recommendations to effectively address the interlinkage. And one of the actual recommendations specifically focused on the importance of data. As I mentioned, in order to better understand and better respond to this linkage, we need data, evidence, and studies more to better understand how the bombard population's health are impacted by climate change. Specifically, the recomm recommendation goes as this. Enhancing robust, comprehensive, up-to-date, up-to-date, sorry, up-to-date and disaggregated data are indispensable to better understand and better address the nexus. IOM recognizes that a practical step for addressing, for fulfilling this recommendation will include three elements. First, promotion of migrant-sensitive health systems through the inclusion of migrant relevant evidence in routine national health data collections, um, such as census and also national disease surveillance. Second, putting in place early warning system at all levels, based on methodological and epidemiological data. And finally, initiating anticipatory action to detect the emergence of disease and illnesses linked to climate change. We have this migration network hub, which is a knowledge um, a platform embedded within the UN network migration website, which offers a practical example of an evidence-based knowledge platform. This migration network um, hub uh, permits the users of the website to explore and access the key resources related to DCM, Global Compact for Migration, and those related to the health as well. So, as we reinforce efforts for achieving the you know, sustainable development goals, including universal health coverage and global compact migration objectives, IOM through its role as a coordinate and secretariat of the uh, UN Network on Migration, we are remain committed to addressing this nexus and interlinkage between migration, climate change, and health, and contributing to strengthening um, the evidence to leave no one behind. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Masako. And I think there's a couple of really important points in there for us to carry through in the conversation. The first is around this holistic approach to mobility. So we're not only looking at people who are displaced due to climate and weather related events, but also the specific vulnerability of uh, migrant workers, those who may be undocumented, who may therefore be more vulnerable to both climate risks and health risks. And then you also no uh, noted a holistic approach to people's needs in terms of physical health, mental health, reproductive health, and more. And then finally, uh, and following on from this call for universal health coverage to include them, I'm hearing a strong call for data and evidence and inclusion of migrant information or migrant needs into a variety of systems, be it access to early warning systems or the data about different needs. So I think these are some really important points to carry through in the presentation, in the conversation, sorry. So now I want to see... Um, if Mr. Stephen Mueller, if you're available now and the connection is working, it'd be great to go to you now. I'll just ask the question again in terms of what do you see as the implications of climate change on health from your perspective as a policymaker? Over to you. Well, thank you very much. I believe you can hear me now. Uh, climate change has been a very... Uh, serious issue and especially in Africa and it has a serious impact on health uh, uh, within the region because of uh, several uh, scenarios especially when we have severe uh, floods within the region uh, we, we are experiencing a serious outbreak of diseases like cholera, morelia uh, within the, the region, and that uh, uh, becomes a tall order uh, to the health sector and pulls the resources uh, very heavily. Uh, the, same thing, the same time is that uh, on the opposite, when there is serious drought, like what was happening in the Horn of Africa right now, you find that uh, the serious impact of uh, health uh, for uh, different uh, vulnerable people, that is the kids uh, the, uh, and the elderly, and also the people living with HIV, also people living with uh, uh, or, uh, people infected with TB, and that uh, affects uh, seriously uh, the health of uh, these uh, groups within the region. So it is important to address the issue of climate change in focus on health of the people uh, globally and the health and to avoid the gains which have been made uh, uh, to uh, deal with some of these diseases like TB, HIV, malaria. And I believe every uh, penny uh, being discussed during this COP27 uh, meeting, they must have a health aspect on it because at the end of the day, climate change, deterioration of health, uh, health sector in uh, many parts of the world, and especially within the African continent. Uh, it is, as you know very well, uh, TB uh, has the high burden within the continent, and it, it's really more related uh, with the change of climate, change of weather, and it really affects uh, these uh, patients because some of them are not able to continue with their drugs, they are not able to continue with their remedies and it becomes very difficult. So from a policy point of view as a lawmaker, most of the countries uh, need to put a lot of measures to make sure that they deal with these phenomena of different change of uh, climate within the region to make sure that we don't lose the gains we have been able to attain uh, during the years uh, 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 on the health sector. Thank you so much, Mr. Mueller. And I think a couple of really important pieces there, that it's not just a question of the impact 
on people's health once they are displaced or if they're on the move and experiencing uh, climate and weather related impacts or climate change but it's also what happens when climate change impacts on people who already have existing medical conditions and such as uh, he was raising in terms of HIV and TB and what this means if somebody is displaced in terms of their access to the medication they need and the health care that they need so thank you very much for those points I think you may have had a couple more points but you were cut off so I'm hoping we can come back to you at the end if you want to raise those as well. So I now want to move to Dr. Maria Guevara, who's the International Medical Secretary for Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, who I'm sure many of you are very aware of. So Maria, what is MSF seeing on the ground when it comes to the impacts of climate change on migration and on health? And what do you see as the priority areas to be addressed, and how can these be addressed? Thank you, Chris, Kirsten. Um, Sabal Khair, good morning and good afternoon to all. Um, and thank you for this uh, invitation to join this great discussion on the, the actual opportunity to discuss this closely connected issues of climate change, migration, and health. For MSF, there is no question, question that these are all defining issues of global health and the humanitarian sector and the world at large. And a presenting, uh, a, press, a pressing point actually here today in the COP27 is a global climate adaptation negotiations are ongoing. What I want to emphasize today is actually the links between these issues and that's the human element and our responsibility to this as humanity in being both the cause of these threats, creating vulnerabilities and inequities due to our ineffective and broken human systems. But hopefully we can change this to bring the source of the solutions instead through an ecosystem approach. So as an international medical humanitarian organization, our teams at Médecins Sans Frontières or Doctors Without Borders are confronted daily with and bear witness to the challenges and experiences that sit at this intersect of this triangle. And for anyone who knows MSF, you'll know that we're working with and responding to the needs of people forced from home, whether that's temporary or permanently, on the move and on, uh, and or arbitra arbitrarily detained, trapped, en route, uh, has been part of the work that we've done for over 50 years today, because we're celebrating our 50 years um, this year. There are many reasons for this displacement and migration. Of course, climate is one, but war and conflict are definitely at front and center. Persecution, disasters, destitution, and political repression. And as an organization, it's easy, it's not easy for us to separate out those drivers. And we wonder if there is um, any advantage to trying to do so, because the point is they are migrating. And while we work to respond on the, to the needs we see, we've struggled to identify the intersects, in fact, with climate change. That would, um, that would actually alter our response. But we know and recognize that with um, what's happening today in the report from the assessment uh, report of, of uh, the sixth assessment report of the IPCC, it's only going to get worse. And we recognize that this trends will accelerate. So what are we seeing? Um, so let's look at the human elements. So human-induced climate change is what uh, the assessment report already says today. So let's take the sudden onset extreme weather events, flooding. What we're seeing in South Sudan, which is considered the fifth vulnerable country today because of conflict, is extremely vulnerable because of the floods that's been hitting the country in the last decade, especially in the last three years. And this massive flooding is just accumulating year on end. One, because um, the water is not being able to be absorbed, and so it just accumulates. But also because you know, they're, they're not able to actually recover from that shock of the one before. And this is actually driving many of, the, of those that we're serving today in, in South Sudan. And what we're seeing is increasing malaria cases, increasing cholera, as we see today, 29 outbreaks globally. And cholera is now breaking out again in South Sudan, even after three years of a lull. So while floods are available, we are trying to match this and anticipate with meteorological and epidemiological data so we can find out and target where malaria and um, burden might increase. So hopefully that will help 
to address the health um, needs. So then let's look at slow onset. There's, there's the actual generation of just general displacement because of whether that's um, people who are, have lost their livelihoods and agricultural capacities. So they're maybe moving an example of Bangladesh where there's soil salinity, river erosion, the floods that we know are hitting South Asia, tropical cyclones and storm surges. And it's important to know that this displacement is much more internally than it is across borders, in fact. And I think we need to remember that. Um, and people are moving actually from rural areas to very dense urban settings. And we know that from our experience in Bangladesh, where we have opened a mission there in um, uh, Kamrang, uh, I never can say this word, um, uh, in the Dhaka slum areas, um, where we know the people, are, the, the people who have moved there are marginalized workers and working in very tough conditions, um, exposed to a lot of chemical pollution, um, living in poor uh, settings, health settings, and they are basically in situations of limbo. And they're in the fringes of society, not being able to access the health care that they need and the humanitarian assistance. So, but they also, so slow onset also generates mass displacement. And we see this with the drought situation in Somalia, um, where we've been for the last a few decades. And there we know that they've been suffering for over um, the last four years with consequent droughts upon droughts on top of already conflict situations. So people are fleeing all the time, trying to find food and trying to flee from conflict with the droughts on top of that making it worse. And they are crossing borders and here they are all exhausted and now and, and unable to actually cope. In Chad, where I was last year, is a similar situation where you are facing multiple um, uh, em health emergencies, in fact, with measles and, and COVID on top of that when I was there last year. At the same time, when they were, you had Cameroonian refugees and Central African refugees coming in as people are trying to find food. And what happens is there's massive malnutrition across the board. And what we're trying to do is understand from the community how we can respond better to them and really engaging them in a more community-led um, approach. But what I, I want to highlight here is the human-induced inequities and vulnerabilities, which are the maladaptive policies that, we're, that we are facing which is the migration policies are of deterrence and um, containment, which is unfortunate. And what we're seeing is significant uh, mental health issues in some of our projects where we are addressing uh, migrant uh, health. In the case of Nauru, we did a global assessment um, of functioning, which is the one way to measure the mental health. And there we noticed that the severe um, scoring in that project was much more than any of our MSF projects. We also saw this in Lesvos, where we are running um, a mental health support project where of the 200, uh, 223 children, um, six of them, between 6 to 18, have tried to commit suicide. It's six year old. Hello. Okay. Trying to commit suicide. That is. Uh, unconscionable. And the last thing is, in the, in the recent flooding um, and landslides ex that Brazil experienced in, um, in, in the uh, forest areas of Brazil, we were able to support uh, with the Ministry of Health and what was, they were able to, they were providing a health care, but what we noticed was the mental health care support for the health care workers. And I think we need to remember that it's not just the migrants who, ha who are suffering, it's also those who are on the front line. So what does this all mean, basically, that migration is, a, is not a, it's a reality, but it's not a new phenomenon. It is part of our history. But, but what is happening today is, is a scale of much global um, uh, expanse. And what we are doing are maladaptive behaviors. And so what I wanted to just raise here is that what we need to do is ensure that what Matsuko has already raised are the frameworks that are more humane and bring this to the table of policy makers and decision makers to recognize that the migrants have to be front and center of these policies, but also not just for basic health care, but also for secondary health care, because that's where the real care needs to be for the severe mental health um, conditions, the non-communicable diseases, the victims of torture needs to be cared as well. 
So as we sit here today in the COP27, let's all join hands to actually bring this issue, this nexus, to the table and make sure that the policymakers and policy decision um, is being made on, in a more humane manner. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. And I think some really important points there, particularly around the human element of human beings being impacted and the need for humanity as a driving force behind our programs and our policies. I think some really interesting insights in terms of the collision of different events, the events that come one after another repeatedly affecting the same community and what that does to them, as well as where you see different colliding events, food insecurity, as well as extreme weather events, as well as displaced communities and how these all overlap. I think it's some really interesting comments around the increases of malaria and cholera as a result of some of these extreme events and this issue about displaced people being left in limbo without the access to the services that they need that are creating short and long-term health impacts. I think this issue around broken human systems and what we need to improve the systems to manage these issues is really important and a really good takeaway from this. You also mentioned the, uh, the health workers, the people on the front line themselves. So it's the communities, but also the people in the communities that are trying to support others. And I think that's a really good segue now to listen to Priska. So Ms. Priska Chisala is from the Malawi Red Cross Society. Um, and she's actually their Director of Programs and Development. So Priska, knowing that the Red Cross National Society has a continuous presence at the local level, in branches, in communities, and constantly working to support vulnerable people to deal with the impacts of climate, to deal with the impacts of displacement, what are some of the barriers that you have seen affecting these people, and what are some of the lessons learned in terms of how we can ensure we're leaving no one behind? Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Kristin. And uh, indeed, my name is Pris Kajisala um, from Malawi Red Cross Society. And uh, you might wish to know, as uh, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Network, we basically uh, operate based on the seven fundamental principles, of which one of the um, important principles that guide our work is impartiality, where we look at um, addressing the needs of vulnerable populations based on the needs regardless of their status. So even uh, people that are migrating are able to, to receive the services that the national societies across the globe are providing. By the end of the day, we really, need, we really want to see no one being left behind. We are even able to reach the uh, places which others um, do not reach to. So they had to reach places are also reached to. And as Malawi Red Cross Society, we are one of the countries that is worst hit by disasters year in, year out. Uh, you might wish to know, towards early, um, early this year, we were hit by tropical cyclone Anna. And as a national society, in our auxiliary role to the public authorities, we supported the government of Malawi in providing various um, health um, services to the displaced populations. So the disasters leading to um, movement or displacement of populations. We found some living in the camps, other um, healthy services like the healthy pools were also disrupted. So you can imagine these are people that are already living in rural areas, these are people that are already vulnerable, and in Malawi, uh, issues of access to healthy services are among the barriers to um, universal access to healthy services. So with uh, issues of disasters coming in year, in year in and year out, definitely these uh, affected or vulnerable populations are the ones that are waste hit. It's like they are being impacted in top, on top of already being vulnerable. And as we're speaking, we are in a season where we have a lot of cholera issues. These are the very same populations that are waste hit. What it means is that there is a lot of demand for healthy services on people that are already um, vulnerable. Therefore, this has, a, in a way, an impact in terms of uh, universal health coverage. So in as much as we might want to uh, reach out to everyone, leaving no one behind, but also issues of um, finances to adequately provide the needed health services is such one issue that is there. And as the Malawi Red Cross 
being auxiliary to the government authorities and also operating through a pool of volunteers that are all over the country. We believe in um, supporting the government efforts by working with uh, government structures at community level, so linking our volunteers that are living right in the communities, that understand the communities better, that are able to understand the health issues of concern in the communities, they are part and parcel of the problems that are happening. And um, we would want to say, I think uh, moving forward, it will really be good to empower such kind of community-based health structures in order to reach out to all, but also as we look at uh, um, providing universal health coverage, we believe in looking at context-specific and affordable um, health services uh, as we try to address the impacts of uh, climate change, of which health is part of it. So um, we would like to, as we are having these discussions, we would like indeed to share that a number of lessons have been learned uh, throughout our interventions as Malawi Red Cross Society, where we are saying universal health coverage is basically trying to address an equal um, access to essential health, health services, and uh, the particular attention is paid to vulnerable populations, including uh, children under five, pregnant women, the elderly, the disabled, and people living uh, with chronic conditions. So our message, or uh, what we've learned is uh, with the increased disasters and epidemics, uh, there is a jeopardy in terms of access to healthy services, which is critical in the universal health uh, coverage. I already mentioned of the tropical cyclone Anna, which hit most parts of uh, the already vulnerable populations early this year. And as a national society, using the pool of volunteers that we already have in the communities, the ones that are called community-based health aid, um, first aid, first aid uh, volunteers, these are provided with the necessary capacity so that they are able to provide at least the local solutions, the basic uh, health solutions that can be provided at local level. So we do train them in issues of uh, disease prevention. They are also participating in health care when um, emergencies have happened. And as we are talking of cholera outbreak at the moment, it is the very community-based health uh, first aid volunteers that are provided with the right messaging depending on the emerging issues at that particular moment. I heard my colleagues mentioning of uh, a number of diseases that come in as a result of uh, changes in weather. We talk of waterborne uh, diseases, of which cholera is part of it. We talk of malaria. So these volunteers that are right in the communities are just equipped with the, uh, the right knowledge or basic knowledges on how to prevent these issues and also how to detect um, such uh, problem so that using the, the little knowledge we are able to at least minimize the impact of the effects of the uh, climate change but also they are provided with information on how they can make referrals so that we, we create a linkage between the local structures and the health uh, service providers. So our key message from the discussions that we would like to convey is the fact that um, it's critical that we empower the communities to be part of the strategies and plans to reduce the risks of climate-related displacement. Uh, we need to engage, engage and engage the communities that we are working with. We need to come up with accountable, accountability activities. We need to make um, the community voices and perspectives to be held and let's make the community members be part of identification of problems that are happening in the communities, be part of the solutions that we would want to see by the end of the day, and also uh, be part of the decision makers in, address, in as far as addressing uh, health, uh, climate impacts that might affect them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Priska, and I think some really important points there around the role of local communities, the role of local actors. If we're ever going to reach the communities that are being left behind, the ones that are hardest to reach, it has to be through support to those communities to actually do the work themselves. And I love this engage, engage, and engage. 
So engaging, supporting problem, uh, communities to be involved in identifying the problems, identifying the solutions, and making the decisions. I think that's fantastic. So I'm now going to move on to one of our online uh, speakers, and I'm actually going to change the order, my apologies, um, for, and go next to Professor Ibrahim Abubakar, because I know he has to leave. So Mr. Ibrahim Abubakar is Dean of the UCL Faculty of Population Health Sciences and Chair of Lancet Migration, Global Collaboration to Advance Migration and Health. So, uh, Ibrahim, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly clearly. Thank you so much. So a question for you, Dr. Ibrahim. What do you think are the key areas where we need high quality evidence to address the impact of the climate crisis um, induced population displacement and how that intersects with health? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to make this intervention, but also uh, for adjusting the program slightly to take into account my uh, availability. Um, so I'd like to start by re reiterating a point you made right at the beginning, because I think many in the health space and across this important meeting uh, lose that in their thinking, which is that the natural human reaction to the effects of anthropogenic climate change is in fact to move from where uh, the disasters are happening, whether it is flooding, rising sea levels, fires or drought or access to food. The consequence of that is displacement within and between national borders. And therefore, we cannot respond to the health consequences of migration or the evidence base and research to inform what we do without taking into account migration within and between countries. It's absolutely critical to the narrative and debate. I'm pleased that there is a session focusing on this. I focus my intervention about what we should do in three broad areas. Health systems and what health systems ought to do, specific mitigation, for insults and events that the health systems can tackle, and finally data and monitoring. So starting with health systems, I think my colleagues from IOM covered some of the broader issues such as universal health coverage. So I'll address a number of dimensions that I think we need better evidence base. The first is the outsized effect in many settings of our activity within the health system in generating a carbon footprint. We have a responsibility to think through how we maximize the efficiency of health systems while reducing our carbon footprint. And this is particularly so for wealthy countries with expensive hospitals and systems that generate a lot of harm to the environment. I think it's critical that the evidence base in that space needs to move as rapidly as the rest of society. It's not just air travel, but massive hospitals have a big carbon footprint. And it is possible to deliver high quality healthcare while minimizing uh, the footprint of the delivery of healthcare. The other dimensions of health systems that I think are critical that need considering is a focus on the most vulnerable, a life course approach, thinking about children and women, people who are fleeing conflict, who ultimately would require more input um, than the rest of society, need to be given the specific relevance and priority as we generate evidence on what to do uh, in health systems, including, importantly, financing. And on the subject of financing, I'd like to urge a bit of caution about while it is important to frame the debate of financing the research as well as services um, in the context of humanitarianism and public good, it's also to remember. It's also important to remember that this the issues um, face that we all face affects everybody in society and the whole planet. Therefore, there is a framing of this conversation that is about self-interest. That wealthy countries have a responsibility because everybody would ultimately be affected by their activity, and it's not just about helping others. Lastly, in relation to health systems, I'd like to make the point about health workers. The necessary changes that we need in the context of displaced populations, where some of those displaced are health workers themselves, and how they are supported to continue functioning effectively to provide the universal health care that we want, and not necessarily by others coming from elsewhere to provide care. So training and research related to that are absolutely critical. The second point I'd like to make very briefly uh, level discussions. Myself is not a health practitioner, so I'm coming more from actually climate change uh, background. Uh, what we are now looking as an IOM in a different country, and I'm actually uh, looking after Middle East and North Africa, is how we can bring migration policy um, synergized with health policies or disaster risk reduction policy. Because as you know, all those policies are 
devised, implemented, monitored by the different entities. Helps naturally by the Ministry of Health, disaster risk reduction often by the entity looked after by DRR, migration by the Ministry of Interior, etc. But they don't necessarily take into account of the, how climate change is impacting on migration, how climate change is impacting on health, how health is impacted by the disasters. So now we're really trying to actually bring synergize how different policy can make sure the climate change impact are addressed in a migration policy, health policy, and vice versa. I think, first of all, we do have to have a strong policy base so that we can actually build and inform the system, like healthcare system, to be responsive to health, you know, the health impact of the climate change. Thank you for that, and thank you for the question. It's quite challenging, and I think from MSF's perspective, um, one of the things that we're trying to do when we're framing climate change and environmental degradation and how it, uh, it will affect our operations and the capacities, we're looking at it, one, one of our sections is looking at it from the planetary health perspective, really looking at we are part of an ecosystem and by actually framing it within that system approach, we, re we see where our responsibilities are and as already been said by the professor, um, are, we are looking at it from the three pillars of operational adaptation where we're looking at the analysis of the situation, really mainstreaming a climate smart lens, looking at it, how we assess um, field projects and how we anticipate, as I've already mentioned. But the second and most important one is this do no harm footprint mitigation. And we are trying to innovate and really looking at road mapping and obtaining our data and measuring our carbon footprint because we know we don't want to be responding and then leaving all kinds of harm because it just feeds into that. But the third and more important, uh, also important, pillar is advocacy and influencing. So while we're not a usual ad, um, uh, policy uh, influencer or in, in the tables usually, we do this by practice and we show what is possible, what we can do on the ground and we work hand in hand with the ministries especially ministries of health and how you actually do this, how you decarbonize, how you green and brainstorm and, and act together in the way that we can still ensure that there is basic and quality health care for all. Sorry. Thank you very much. And for me, just to add that, um, I think looking at the discussions that we are having here already, we are looking at uh, the nexus between climate change, health and migration. So I think I would look at it from the programming perspective to say, um, as we are designing our interventions that are trying to address effects of uh, climate change, especially, for example, migrants, I would look at uh, the need for integrated programming. Like instead of looking at one side of the story, we need to bring all, we need to have a multi-sector kind of approach to our programming in order to really address uh, these uh, issues that we have already demonstrated and we have already, evidence has already shown that they are in one way or the other linked. So we need not to address uh, the issues in isolation of the other. But also I'm looking at the policies that uh, my colleagues also mentioned, that we need to look at also policies that are talking to one another. But I think apart from the, having the policies talking to one another, I think it will also be good to reach to the root, uh, to, 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 to the grassroots where the people that are affected by these issues are staying. Let's also hear their voice. Let them be part and parcel of informing these policies that we would want to speak to one another instead of probably us sitting in the offices, just doing literature, but also getting the, the, the primary voice from those that are affected. I think it's also critical so that indeed we have evidence-based kind of interventions which have um, great impact by the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. I now want to see if we've got any of our colleagues online. Just a moment, and then we've got a question in the front row. Are any of our colleagues online there? Yes. Ah, brilliant. I, do you want to either add something to what you said or respond to the question? And we do have a couple of questions in the room as well. Yes, yes I, did. I need to put up uh, some uh, interventions which I think they are very important to uh, the discussion going on and the first intervention probably need to be looked at by most of the government is uh, proper structures and proper uh, strategic planning in letter to uh, climate change based on the evidence given by different meteorological departments in the in their country 
uh, putting up uh, food sustainable programs and giving out uh, uh, seeds which are uh, drought resistant, especially in the Horn of Africa, and pro provide a solution on uh, 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 massive irrigation to provide enough food. Uh, increased uh, domestic funding uh, for both health sector and agriculture sector and investment on uh, uh, several programs uh, within the, uh, the individual and specific countries and uh, having specific uh, programs on uh, pregnant mothers who are highly affected during climate change, children, the elderly uh, people, uh, people uh, uh, with pre-existing conditions like HIV, TB, and the rest, also come up with uh, feeding programs, especially in schools, to make sure that there's a clear, sustainable growth of mental health, uh, uh, of mental uh, within the kid, the children. Uh, uh, the last two interventions that I want to hear. Uh, coming out clearly is the political goodwill uh, by global leaders to make sure that they are able to deal with uh, this issue. And the last is to make sure that we have very clear uh, supply, sustainable uh, supply chain uh, for essential uh, products like drugs and uh, uh, essential goods like mosquito nets, uh, testing uh, kits for areas whereby we have uh, outbreaks of uh, corona and the rest, and make sure that we have a very elaborative uh, data collecting uh, mechanism within various governments to make sure that at least they are aware of the numbers to uh, affected and the numbers to be protected uh, due to this uh, climate change. Last but not least is we would wish to uh, see a political declaration by the end of states to make sure that we deal with uh, these issues precisely and call upon different governments uh, proper, clear policies which can be, uh, can all the governments of the day accountable of their deeds and their actions towards climate change. <coughs> Thank you very much for that. And I think a couple of important uh, additional points in there in terms of looking at the intersection of different sectors and mention of food security, education, and how these intersect with issues around migration and issues around health. Um, I'd like to check if uh, we have Vienko Hun Surio on the line yet. Are you there? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm here. If you'd like to, if, great. So we have Vienka Honsurio, the Executive Director of Community Health and Inclusion Association in the Lao People's Democratic Republic. So Mr. Surio, we understand that the Lao People's Democratically, De Democratic Republic is disproportionately vulnerable to specific projected climate change trends. And that you lead an organization that works closely with communities on inclusion and community-led services. And this is an issue that Prisca in particular has raised as being really vital in terms of how we address these issues. It would be really good to hear from you, how do you see the impacts on climate, of climate change on the communities that you work with? And what, who are the most affected? And if you have any specific recommendations for decision makers, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Host. Um, um, actually, Laos is in the, the middle of the ASEAN country. So we are in landlocked um, and also have um, the five countries around Laos. It's uh, China, um, um, Thailand, um, Myanmar, uh, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Of course, uh, we are working closely with the um, uh, TB, HIV, and malaria in the Mekong country. So we have a very good network and platform with the um, CSO in the region. So uh, um, the climate change is 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 very big impact um, to the to the to Lao PDR because uh, uh, most population in Lao is it's um, the more than uh, fifty percent is working in the agriculture. So. Uh, when the climate change, particularly from the driving season, is the, the uh, most of uh, they have no water, 
and then mostly the young people is not is not in the rural area they cross border to work in in other country like uh, thailand as you can see that is more than uh, more than uh, uh, 200,000 people is the migrant from laos uh, is working in thailand so this is the big impact because they are they have nothing to do in the country uh, because of the climate change so um um we think that the uh, most uh, the effect of the of this uh, climate change most the uh, migrant young people uh, cross border there is as they have been affected uh, except for the healthcare because because the we can see that the, uh, the number of uh, of the tb increased the number of the hiv increased among uh, migrant worker particularly for the uh, lgbt uh, female sex worker who are who are working in the entertainment industry in, in, in Thailand. So, um, and also the second thing that we can we see, really see the in big impact uh, during the pandemic uh, of the COVID-19, we can see that more than uh, 40 or 50% of the undocumented migrant worker cross border, uh, the first uh, to cross border to, uh, back to, 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 to country. This is the this is the big impact, uh, big uh, affected of uh, of the people in the in the uh, Mekong uh, around Mekong uh, pro provinces of Lao PDR. So uh, my my recommendation because because you you know that uh, most uh, more than two hundred undocumented migrant from Lao is close to working uh, in in Thailand. So when when they see the experience of the uh, pandemic of the COVID nineteen, so the the most migrant is fought. Uh, um, from the recipient country back to hometown, the our support of the economic and also the big of the uh, stigma and discrimination, particularly for right and gender, is not really protects not really protects for them. This is we can see the big impact in the year uh, 2020 and 2021. Uh, that's that's so my recommendation. I think that's the first thing how to ensure that all the my recipient country have very good policy to protect of the migrant worker in the recipient country because of because this one uh, most of them uh, from from country they they, they go there uh, without support from uh, the uh, the treatment particularly for tb and hiv and also the uh, cross border of malaria uh, uh, treatment is not received uh, very well and the cost of the treatment is very high so how to ensure that is weak they can uh, accept for healthcare with low cost and high quality the second thing i think that's the how to ensure that is that the right and gender have been protected particularly for the undocumented migrant worker the last thing um the lastly i think uh, how to how uh, uh, the civil society organization between the, uh, the departure country or migrant country uh, and recipient country have working closely to ensure that the, the community-led health services have functioning uh, both the departure country and, and recipient country, including the data sharing is the how to, how we can refer of the case uh, country by country. It's as over to you. I'm so glad you're finally able to join us. That was great. And I think some really important issues there around how climate is not only forcing people to cross borders, but then when they're crossing borders, they're being hit not only by climate and weather related impacts, but also by um, health crises such as COVID. So looking at the intersection of climate and COVID there, also this challenge around protection for migrant workers, their access to healthcare and basic needs, the importance of community-led health services and the importance of data sharing between countries in order to be able to better meet the needs of different people on the ground. So that's, that's really useful. Thank you very much. We had a question in the room, so I want to go to that question and then I'm actually going to turn to our colleagues online. I know we have... Okay. We'll, <laughs> well, we'll be a bit careful with that with the two mics in the room, I think. Um, and then I'm going to go back to some of the colleagues online to be the ones to answer first. So maybe if we can have the first question in the room. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you to all the speakers for the very nice discussion. I'm Dr. Srihari Govind, and I'm representing the Migration Youth and Children Platform. We are the official youth constituency of the GFMD, and a 
Our focus this year is a lot of ways on climate, health, and the migration nexus. So my first question, I think it was a little bit partially answered by uh, the panelists from the Republic of Lao. But my first question is how do you ensure, because policy does not in, mean political will. So how do you ensure that there is political will for youth on the move, especially since you know, many are young migrants, for youth on the move to access all these health services, mental health, gender services, SRHR services, uh, and all that. And my second question is, how, uh, the first question is, how do you ensure the political will? It, uh, because we, as the youth constituency, we see a lot of uh, policy which has been brought up, but the political will lacks a lot. The second is, uh, migration falls right on the center of uh, loss and damage. So what exactly are the local solutions? Because right now the finances, uh, loss and damage discussions are just starting and we need finances urgently. How do you, what are the local solutions that can be taken for migration in the context of loss and damage? Thank you. Thanks so much for that question. Now, well, those two questions. I see now that we have Dr. Ali Ardalan has now appeared on, on the line. So I might actually ask Dr. Ali Ardalan, maybe I have a question for you, but then maybe you might want to answer perhaps the first question also that was raised and we'll go around the room. Um, so Dr. Okay. Ali Ardalan is the regional advisor at the WHO regional office for the Eastern Mediterranean. And we had a question for you, Dr. Ardalan, which is what actually should we, the global public health community, take to tackle the climate health migration nexus? And just to note the question that's been asked around um, policy changes and also around the role of youth and inclusion of youth and some of the particular concerns of youth. If you want to touch on some of those issues as well in your response, you'd be very welcome to do so. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfectly. Uh, Great question. So let me please uh, start with the first one and then uh, we'll address the second question as well. Um, actually, uh, first I want to emphasize on the fact that the interaction between climate change, migration and health, uh, as was also elaborated by previous speakers, is complex and is a growing area of concern globally. Climate change and environmental degradation are increasingly driving human mobility particularly in countries with high exposure and low adaptive capacity. Uh, shelter as one of the areas that is greatly affected when we have disaster. So I'm talking about Malawi. I'm giving a practical example of Malawi. Like when we have disasters, usually the disasters will range from droughts, strong winds, floods. And from these, one of the areas that is greatly affected in terms of the loss and damages are the shelters. So how, so how houses get swept away, um, the, the roofs get blown off and stuff. So usually in terms of coming up with solutions, we will not just sit and uh, um, dictate in terms of the intervention. So we will do like needs assessment. So our interventions must be informed by one, what are the um, assessments saying on the ground? How, what are the damages? And also from the damages, we need to see, I mean, the ability of the communities to address such damages. So, like I said, there would be solutions that the communities can participate in, be it short term or long term. So, for example, what we've noted is that in the areas that are like, for example, disaster plan, where we face floods year in, year out, we've noted that communities are also, not, are also he hesitant to move from such places for various reasons. One of it being issues of leadership. They fear that if they move to another place, it means they'll be new and they may lose chieftainships, local leaderships and the like. So what we do basically is to look at how can they build back better? What approaches can we uh, impart or provide to them so that they are able to, for example, create flood resilient houses? So this is one of the solutions that we provide to say we do uh, support them to be able to uh, construct flood resilient houses. But then again, we do also fa consider the factor, the, the affordability part of it. So again, we don't want to just impose or we don't want to kind of uh, provide solutions that 
are not accessible, affordable to them. So we will, look, we will, we will go for um, like promoting use of locally available resources to build resilient shelters. So in this case, what we provide them with is the technical support. But then we also, we also involve them in terms of mobilizing the resources. So in this case, in terms of the shelter, in terms of coming up the, with the um, uh, flood resilient houses, in this, in this case, we will look at, for example, populations that are living in flood prone areas to make sure that as they are constructing or building back better, they need to, for example, raise the foundation of their houses. So that should we have another floods, it means they will be affected, yes, but in terms of the shelter, they, the building should still be a, there, regardless of the floods that they are going to, 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 to see. So that's just one example in terms of um, providing local solutions by using locally available resources to build back resilient or mat, mat, mat flood resilient uh, shelters. This is just one example. However, we've also noted that... Um, when the uh, communities are affected, there are some areas that uh, are affected but cannot be addressed by the communities themselves. So we we'll talk of, for example, uh, public infrastructure, the loads and the like. So this is an area, again, that requires like a multi-sectoral approach but also being open enough to work with or to engage um, the uh, various development partners and the like to come in and support with us. So in other words, it's also very important that we work in a coordinated manner. So I will look at uh, our practical example again of Malawi to say, for example, us as Malawi Red Cross, we operate through our volunteers who are right, residing right in the communities. They are the ones that are affected when disasters have happened. They will be supporting in terms of uh, providing a uh, first response. But even when other actors have left, the volunteers will still be there to support the, the communities that we are working with. So again, it's an area that we, we would also say when we are addressing the loss and damages. Let's not only focus on um, responding. We need to also invest more in terms of uh, uh, anticipatory actions, early preparedness activities to avoid uh, much losses should there be disasters. So again, we have interventions that are promoting early warning activities, strengthening early warning systems. So we also do use local means of uh, strengthening early warning actions in the communities. For example, we do use local knowledge to say, we ask, actually, we get it from the communities themselves to say, how do you know, or at least, how do you predict that we are going to have probably more lanes or whatsoever? You will be amazed that they have local knowledge on, on, on these things. And you take the very same knowledge to cascade and uh, make sure that the communities are able to use it in terms of preparing to disaster so that we can, in the end, reduce losses. But again, we'll go back to the issue of a multi-sectoral approach. To say us, as for example, act, humanitarian actors, we work with the other government agencies that are responsible for providing early warning messages. So in this case, us as a humanitarian actor, we work with, the, for example, the Climate Change Department to get the seasonal focus, the early warning messages that we receive, we translate it into local languages and disseminate through our volunteers to the people that we are working with so that that information is not only ending at uh, the people that are just generating this information, but we want to make sure that it reaches the people that would use this information to minimize the loss itself. I'll give you a very practical example of what happened. Okay, thank you. So, so a very good example is what happened earlier this year when we had a uh, tropical cyclone, uh, Anna. So we got the messages from the climate change regarding the warning the people that were in flood prone areas. And by the time we were receiving the floods, they had already moved. It means at least they saved some of the losses in terms of the property as well as life. So it needs preparing in advance, early warning activities, anticipatory activities, be without necessarily just waiting to respond when disasters have happened. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Priska. And I see that we now have the Zoom back, so apologies for the technical difficulties. And uh, I'm sad that we've missed some of the comments from our speakers online. So we're going to give you each a couple of minutes just to give a final couple of inputs. We're running close to time, so I'm actually going to start the final round of inputs, if that's all right. But we'll start with our colleagues online because you've missed out on a little bit of a ch your chance to intervene. And we might start first with uh, Dr. Christopher Kalila. If you want to 
to either respond to any of the questions that were asked or to give us like a one minute of what do you see as the most important action for any of us to take individually or collectively to address these issues. That would be really great. And then after you, I'm going to move to Dr. Ali. Okay, so we'll go around the, the group that are online and then we'll come back to the room. So over to you, Dr. Christopher Kalila. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, I want to commend the, the organizers for inviting me. My name is Dr. Kalila. I'm from the National Assembly of Zambia. I'm chairman of the Health Committee, as well as the uh, SADC co-chair for tuberculosis, uh, Rea Mule, who is in the room, is uh, my president. First of all, I am responding to one of the issues raised. It was the question of political will. And uh, political will is very important, particularly in any of these uh, uh, global problems that we are facing, such as climate change. And it's very gratifying to note that uh, just a couple of days ago, our heads of state were gathered in, El in Shamul Shak in Egypt there. And that's what it starts from. My colleague mentioned the issue of a political declaration. We need one. But most importantly, we must also begin to involve national parliaments because parliamentarians hold governments to account. They, f they, they, they vote budgets. They also um, involve in legislation and they represent people so that we are not uh, left out as is the case right now, which speaks to the values of, of partnership. So political roles, that's... Seem to have lost you, Dr. Kalila. You might want to turn off your video to see if we have some more bandwidth. And in the meantime, I suggest we go to Dr. Ali if you want to jump in and see if we get we Dr. Christopher just, back. I hope next time we'll be invited. Thank you. All right. Dr. Ali, do you want to jump in and be the next to answer the question? I'm hoping your bandwidth will survive long enough for you to speak this time. Please go ahead. Actually, I will uh, try to be quick. Uh, I don't know actually uh, where uh, <laughs> you um, uh, lost the connection, but uh, let me just uh, quickly review on the next steps that we propose uh, that the global public health community take. Uh, firstly, we need to acknowledge the impact on health and displacement in discussions around climate change and include the health of displaced population into climate related policies, action plans, and health system responses. Secondly, migrants, displaced persons, and the affected communities need to be involved in and included in the process of deliberating on and formulating policies and strategies related to the nexus of climate change, migration, and health. Thirdly, we must support countries to have robust and migrant inclusive health systems by outlining the importance of ensuring universal health coverage for all people. This is exactly also acknowledged in the Global Compact for Migration, Global Compact for Refugees, and in the SDG3 to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. Next, we must support the development of global research priorities and ensure the needed resources are available to improve our understanding not only of these impacts, but also of what works. To this end, the WHO Health and Migration Program is leading the first WHO Global Research Agenda on Health and Migration, which includes a key theme as Climate Change, Migration and Health. And finally, we must renew and strengthen the commitment and engagement from all actors to work together on this topic. Together and in close collaboration with all levels of government and partners, as WHO, we will continue working toward climate resilient and migrant sensitive health systems and uh, policies. Hopefully this time you could hear me. That did work and you were yes. here. Okay. Thank you Thank so you much. Us. And I think that last comment around the engagement at all levels, so all levels of government as well as other stakeholders outside of government working collectively to address these issues is a really important one as we close this, uh, this session down. I'm now going to give just one minute to, actually we've got a little bit less than one minute, to each of the speakers for just one final takeaway ask or recommendation. I'll go first to uh, Dr. Mueller. 
if you, Mr. Stefan Mueller, if you want to go next, and then I'll go around the room here. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the FRC of working together uh, at all levels uh, cannot be underestimated, and it has to be uh, uh, put very clearly. The political goodwill of leadership across the globe must be emphasized to the letter. And working with parliamentarians, working with the county governments or uh, the lower part of lower part of governments, uh, working with the executive, that is the, uh, the the executive within government, and working with community uh, uh, volunteers, uh, community uh, health workers, uh, community uh, uh, society, and the civil society. This issue must be a total collective approach for all the citizens of the world, unless we don't want to step on the accelerator adding to climate end. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Priska, and then we're going to go one at a time back. Just your, your final last ask or recommendation. Thank you very much. Uh, my final ask is that we need to make sure that healthy services are accessible, available, and affordable to all. Thank you. So what we are facing today is a crisis of humanity that's leading into a climate crisis and worsening the health crisis and humanitarian crisis. It, it, it actually takes each and every one of us recognizing our role and responsibility to ensure that we choose health for all and address a climate crisis together because doing so is not just a nice to do, it's a must do, it saves lives. Thank you. Talking about the vulnerability, we also have to remember the trapped population or so-called immobile population are also vulnerable as much as those people who are already on the move as well. And just um, referring to what the Prisca said um, earlier, just one of the recommendations which came out of the Marrakesh conference that we organized, it's very important to hear their voices and also involve those mobile population in the decision-making processes related to migration, climate change, and uh, health. Thank you. So thank you so much for all of the speakers. I think there are some really powerful messages in there. What I'm taking away from this is, first of all, this importance of a holistic approach when it comes to types of movement, types of vulnerability, and types of need. And secondly, hearing a really clear ask to look at these intersecting issues, be they overlapping crises, overlapping needs, issues around food security, health, displacement, shelter, and how much they intersect. I'm hearing a call for coherent work together with all stakeholders in all levels of government, and in particular involving local communities and local organizations, listening to them, putting them at the forefront of designing the programs to respond, understanding what their needs are and letting them drive the solutions. And finally, this overarching powerful framework that has been mentioned by some of our speakers of humanity at the core of all we do, and using a framework of humanity to design our systems, design our responses, and reach those that are currently being left behind. So a huge thank you to all of our speakers online and in the room. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for all your excellent interventions.
Hello, good afternoon. Sorry, we started a bit late. My name is Tineke Unema. I am the Executive Secretary of UN Nutrition, and UN Nutrition is the coordinating mechanism for nutrition in the United Nations systems. Welcome to this event. We will have a few people in the room. We will have a few people online, as well as the speakers who are both online and, and in our room. So this is a hybrid event. Um, you will be able to submit questions throughout the event on the Mentimeter that, that is also online using the code on, on the screen. There's a code on the screen. There is not yet a code on the screen. You, what you now on the, see on the screen is the title of the event, which is Integrating Nutrition in NDCs, Nationally Determined Contributions. Maybe you can go uh, to the next slide. What we would like to do now, as an icebreaker, is to get your thoughts. Instead of us sharing our thoughts with you, we thought, okay, let's start with you, the audience. Share your thoughts. We want to have your thoughts before we start the event. And we can use uh, the Mentimeter for that. So if you can get the code. Yeah, I think the, the, the technicians are still trying to move the slides. I'm not sure if there's anyone there. Otherwise, we do the Mentimeter afterwards. We are checking. Yeah, we do it later. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it would be great to uh, to get the first fly, uh, slide. Is this one working better? A little bit. This one is working. OK, excellent. So um, for today, Claudia Ringler and myself will set the scene for this event with providing you a little bit of scientific background information. And for me, I will providing you with almost some no-brainers to get us all on the on the same page and see where we are coming from. Um, what I what I will do basically is share with you some insight that I've heard uh, in several events that I've been attending prior prior to this one. So, if we can get the next slide, please. And of course, what I'm going to look at is basically the several linkages between nutrition and climate change. Here we are. I think we can even go to the next slide. This is the Mentimeter, so we can skip that one. We are a little bit behind, uh, behind our uh, schedule, so let's skip the Mentimeter. We can do the next one. One always thinks you get used to hybrid events even, but apparently not. You can move on. You can move on. You can move on.
I think we're almost there. One next slide. Yeah, and now the next one. I promise you some no-brainers. Here we are. As I mentioned, the nutrition environmental nexus. What I want to emphasize here is the bi-directional uh, links between nutrition and environment. The food we eat, but not the, just the food we eat, how we produce it and how it travels from farm to plate determines how food systems affect human and, human and planetary health and the other way around. What we also see is that greenhouse gas emissions from food systems are increasing, it's going up, negatively affecting climate change. We are at about one third of total greenhouse gas emissions that come from our food systems. So that's what we are talking about. We need to go down there. That bi-directionally, again, climate change affects our ability to produce and to consume, consume healthy diets from sustainable food systems. Now to the solutions. If you combine food, nutrition and environmental targets, it can support food system transformation and the achievement of the Paris Agreement. We are looking at win-wins here. We are not looking at, at, at uh, uh, trade-offs, we are looking at win-wins. Can you move on to the next one? So, looking at the various sectors, nutrition, agriculture, environment, I could go on, social protection, water, all sectors must, must act jointly to promote and pursue coherent policy options, coherent policy options that can generate co-benefits for people and for the planet. And we have existing tools, we have existing food and social policy areas, like for example, food-based dietary guidelines, food labeling, regulations, limits on food marketing, public food procurement, these are tools that work. We have the evidence, we have examples in various countries. And these tools, they could and should include environmental sustainability targets alongside nutrition incomes. That would be the cadeau, the offer from nutritionists to the environmental community. We can work hand in hand there. Finally, final point before I hand over to Claudia. Greater access to healthy diets from sustainable food systems food systems transformation and improved nutrition should be included as targets in the NC NDCs, the nationally determined contributions and the national adaptation plans. To make that concrete in these plans, in these contributions will help to unlock finance to make these plans a reality. So that's what we are com where we are coming from and where we should be heading to. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Claudia Ringler uh, from our CGIR colleagues. Who will? The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Let's hope we we'll continue to get through things. Next slide, please. So yeah, this is uh, basically what I'll quickly talk about. Five points of why mitigation action needs to track nutrition impacts. Next slide. So in the following couple slides, I'll basically repeat or explain why those are the five, uh, six key messages uh, you know, that I think we should all, at a minimum, uh, take away uh, from this session. First, generally mitigation by lowering emissions improves agriculture production, productivity, also other food system components, for example, you know, transportation, etc. So the roads are not as hot. And so food security and nutrition are enhanced for mitigation generally, but not all mitigation is created equal. There are many key mitigation actions that you find in all of the IPCC reports that actually directly increase food prices and grow hunger. Um, there's also other mitigation action that affects different populations differently and are particularly bad for vulner vulnerable populations and livestock, um, beef, cattle mitigation uh, often can have very bad uh, impacts for, for vulnerable populations, livestock herders, women farmers, etc. 
And it's also important to go further because nutrition is constituted not just from calories. There is uh, the time that women have for caring for their children. So we also need to assess to what extent mitigation actions, particularly in the agriculture sector, affect uh, livelihoods of women and men farmers uh, and their time use. Another reason of why we really need to track nutrition in the NDCs is that changing diets to, with this latest IPCC report is actually an active mitigation strategy that is supported and advocated for by IPCC. So if actually now some countries say, yes, we're changing our diets, again, we have to make sure uh, that the dietary change actually really reduces emissions and second, doesn't um, adversely affect nutrition outcomes. We also should track nutrition and use this integrated approach because there are intentional nutrition policies such as the food-based dietary guidelines that consider environmental sustainability that can actually reduce emissions or retain nutrition under climate change. Yeah, and finally, if we do, do not make this linkage, we actually can really worsen outcomes for nutrition. So I'm just quickly, next slide going back over these points. So the first one is very clear. For example, Joe Biden yesterday talked about reducing methane emissions in the industrial sector. A very clear linkage. Emissions in this industrial methane uh, subsector down, yields up, and that's livestock and crops, also better for fisheries, etc. Food, price, food prices uh, are lower and diets are improved. And then just below, this is an analysis uh, I worked on a couple of years ago, and we looked at the impact of a uh, global tax on, on fossil fuels. What does it do to the number of people at risk of hunger? And I'm just showing here two regions because it's otherwise a big graph. And the, uh, the, second, the second bar from the top is a baseline without climate change. The lighter green just below is a baseline with climate change under the RCP 8.5. And then we introduce the uh, carbon price or fossil fuel tax. And what we actually see is that hunger goes up. So hunger actually doesn't go down, it goes up because as a result of the carbon tax, fertilizer becomes more expensive, diesel prices become more expensive, but they're needed to pump water, of course, for domestic, but also for irrigation. And, of course, because we have much higher energy prices, we also had a CG model, incomes of poor people are much lower because they also rely on access uh, to transportation, fuel, etc. It's more or less the, you, the war in Ukraine, that's what you see right now. It is as if we have a tax on fossil fuel, among others. So then, we introduced an adaptation or a mitigation scenario, adaptation to the fossil fuel tax, uh, and there it really depends what kind of adaptation measure or mitigation measure you introduce to try to lower food to this, uh, you know, um, number of people at risk of hunger. But of course what usually is being introduced is, or often, is bioenergy, um, expanding bioenergy crops, and here we also added uh, increased hydropower production, so more renewable energy production. And in this particular case, that increased the, the risk of hunger yet further because of the bioenergy uh, crop and land competition with food crops. So this is just you know, to show these analyses have been done some time ago, but the IPCC reports continue to advocate for bioenergy crops. Uh, next slide, please. And then this just shows that there's now actually a bunch of studies that uh, state the same thing. So the first one I've already explained, the global carbon tax uh, grows food security. Oh, and just to add, if the carbon tax is introduced with supporting social safety nets and other supports for poor people, if the carbon tax gets us on a lower emissions pathway, we can actually reduce hunger and we can improve food security. So it's not a zero-sum game, it depends on how it's being done. So that was the first study. The second one, uh, focuses on what they call stringent global mitigation. They really try to put all of the mitigation measures in that get us to a 2.6 scenario, and they found that it'll add 78 million people uh, who are food insecure, and they claim that if you stay at a 
RCP 6.0 scenario, we only have uh, 24 million people, additional people that are more food insecure. Again, they use the IPCC mitigation um, investments and suggestions, but not the ones from the latest report. This is a 2018 study. And then there's another study that's also quite recent that found that afforestation grows food insecurity even more than bioenergy mitigation. Again, there's a huge competition for land. Land prices go up. And basically because there's this higher value for afforestation, if it's being used for mitigation, then you actually grow food insecurity. And then the last study is also of interest here because we focus on vulnerable people. And what they analyzed also quite recently is if we just implement um, a land use change tax in high income countries. So that means that a lot of the uh, emissions are being outsourced to low and middle income countries and they focus on Southern Africa where it's already a very dry water scarce environment and they found that these uh, tax on, on land use to, to reduce emissions grew water and energy insecurity in Southern Africa because much more food suddenly had to be produced there. So next to, to uh, next, yeah. Um, next, yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, and then this one is a bit more differentiated. Why different mitigation strategies matter for different people? So livestock mitigation is, of course, a key area the ag sector focuses on, but it can can affect access to animal sourced foods and also we know that women are more involved in livestock production than men in low and middle income countries both South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So if it's not done well, their income and their nutrition will be reduced. Again, we already have the situation right now with higher fertilizer and pesticide prices. Could have come from a carbon tax, but it comes from a different source right now. Um, and it, we already know it's reducing food production. Third, we also know there's a lot of these agroecological approaches that are being, uh, that are being supported to, to mitigate emissions. And, but we have to look into the, um, the labor implications because women tend to actually spend more time on these approaches than men. Women already are very time um, constrained. And so again, that will affect their time available for childcare and thus nutrition. Solar irrigation and other technology I work on a lot. We know it depletes groundwater faster than other technologies and so it affects drinking water access and again that affects women disproportionately because they have to actually get the drinking water. Bioenergy I think is the you know, most well studied uh, challenge that we have. We know it competes with crops for land, water, capital, labor. Um, pollutes also, it's, it's corn and sugar are more polluting for drinking water sources, coastal areas. So all of that has been very well studied, but bioenergy continues to be promoted as a key mitigation strategy. In some countries, some places, solar systems and wind parks directly compete with land for food production. Some places, hydroelectricity production competes with irrigation for water. And carbon capture and storage also competes. Next slide, please. Uh, also can compete with land and also irrigation water. So you don't need to read this slide, you can read this slide. This is the latest IPCC report that for the first time suggests a shift, a shift to balanced sustainable healthy diet as one of the key mitigation options that should be suggested. So there's the Afolo sector here. And now we have sustainable healthy diets right there. They don't know what it costs, that's why it's great. So if countries put it into their NDCs, you know, uh, we really need to make sure what they're doing, how they're doing it. Next slide, please. We're almost done. It's also important, the linkage is important because we do need intentional nutrition policy that can reduce emissions or retain nutrition uh, as a, under climate change. So taxes on red meat in high income countries uh, are not a bad thing. They will actually grow access to meat in low and middle income countries. So they'll do some to emission reductions, not that much, but they do some and it's actually good. So more meat access in poorer countries. Taxes on sugary drinks everywhere. I think it's a no brainer. Um, emissions, everything can be, can be improved and nutrition. The breeding of drought tolerant, um, heat stress, etc. crops, increased nutrient use efficiency. There's a, a bunch of things that can be done in agricultural research. Uh, that's all actually very good for emission reduction and very good for nutrition and food security. Uh, there are a lot of work is now being done on cultured proteins for milk, cultured meat, clean fish, all very promising for nutrition and they reduce emissions. 
biofortified crops, of course, because there's nutrient leaching of uh, key staple crops that, again, mostly affect poor countries. And finally, you know, any mitigation strategies, if you're considering nutrition, should be time and labor saving. And then finally, really the last point, last slide. Um, it, I, I strongly believe, you know, in when Stinica said, should we, should we <laughs> put nutrition linkages in NDCs? Yes, but we have to do a lot more. Um, the NDCs alone are not that helpful because the quality of many of those NDCs are low, if you've read some of them. Um, they lack specificity, most of them. Very few have very good quantitative target. They are non-binding. Um, so also we need to focus on, on NAPs and, and NAPAs. And then we also need to be aware that these NDCs are, you know, have this quantity, national level uh, focus, but subnational diff sub differences are important. And then, as I said, if high income countries do one thing, it will affect other countries. Uh, the same, of course, if low income countries do something. So the linkages will not come out of the NDCs because they're all done at the national level. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Claudia, to, for adding some brains to my for adding some brains to my no-brainers. That was really helpful, and it's of course I agree with you. It's not so simple or straightforward to sh to shift from one system to another. There's so many issues that we need to take into account. And Claudia warned us: if we do not connect sectors, if we do not make the linkages, we may have bad outcomes. But let me turn it around again. So if we do make the linkages and if we do make the connections, good outcomes make out, come out of it. So let's, let's again uh, focus on, on how to best integrate nutrition in NDCs, but taking all these, these other uh, issues into account, take into account the multi-level governance, and of course do not forget it about the NAPs either. Uh, I mean, I should have said that from the beginning. So great, thank you so much for these uh, insights, Claudio. Can I now please invite my uh, first two panelists to, uh, to join me here on stage from uh, both both WHO and, uh, and IFAD. We have uh, Ms. Ricky Oliveira, who is the Global Senior Specialist of Natural Resource Management in, uh, in IFAD. Um, and then we, we also have uh, Dr. Diarmit Campbell Lendrum, if I pronounce your name more or less okay, who is uh, the Climate Change and Health uh, Team Lead in, uh, in WHO. So, um, Ricky, if I can uh, call you like this, can I please ask you, um, greenhouse gas emissions from food systems, they are increasing uh, and they are negatively affecting climate change and in turn, uh, climate change affects our ability to produce and consume healthy diets from sustainable food systems. So, how is EVAT contributing to curb this negative trend? What are the challenges and opportunities for small-scale producers, uh, and how can how could governments uh, repurpose investments in the agriculture sector for sustainable food systems and healthy diets? Just a small question. <laughs> yeah, just a small question. <laughs> no, um, thank you, and ladies and gentlemen, very happy to be here and invited on this uh, panel. So IFAD, for the ones of you who do not know us, we are a small fund inside the UN and we invest in, in rural people and our mandate is rural poverty. So we are out there in rural areas where the most poor people are because this is our mandate. So we invest in inclusive rural economies and to give people the opportunity of have pathways out of poverty. So just to say who we are, we invest more or less, we approve loans and grants for more or less 1 billion US dollars per year. So also a little bit the size of what we do. And we invest through these longer term projects. They are normally have a time span from five to seven years. And they, can, they are co-financed by governments, by us, by other development partners. So it's kind of this size of, of investments from all it could be from 30 million to up to 200 million each project, just to say, and we invest through the governments. So just to set that stage of who we are. So what are the challenges? Of course, mitigation is a big, big challenge. But when you look at the small scale producers that we support, they are not the ones who are creating this problem. They are the, on the forefront of receiving end of the impacts. And that is becoming more and more serious and it's going faster and faster. 
But the small scale producers are really, really important. They produce around a third of the food that is consumed on this planet, and they do it on 11% of the land. So take those, those two figures together, that's why they are important. They are actually quite efficient, if you think about it, in the global figures. At the same time, we don't invest in them. Now talking about climate change, only less than 2% of the climate financing in this world goes to small scale producers, less than 2% despite the importance for food security and precision. And then, of course, we have this global challenge that 3 billion people on this planet in 2020 could not afford a healthy diet. So these are kind of the challenges. So in EFAT, we focus first on adaptation because the challenges are getting fast. I mean, they're growing faster and faster. And we do need to do adaptation. So adaptation, adaptation. And then we look for the co-benefit with mitigation. Again, because the people we serve are not the big emitters. So, so just to, to say that first, so, so how do we do that? There are these linkages that are quite clear between diversity in what you produce as a small-scale producer or as a community, on the one hand. Resilience, because resilience comes from diversity as a key factor. If you have diversity in your farming system, you always have a plan B. When you have a diversity in your income systems in your household, you always have a plan B. We need plan Bs as the world are, are, are moving right now. When you have diversified farming systems, you also have the first entrance point to diversified diets. So this is kind of the key thing we are looking at when we go out and support governments, farmers organizations, cooperatives in investing in their food systems and increasing their resilience. When we invest and if we if we, all, if we achieve to increase people's incomes, another thing that we have learned is that often we see diet quality goes down. When people get more money, they invest in the wrong food for their families. So when we do this type of investment, it needs to be accompanied with the capacity building in nutrition. It has to go hand in hand. And then one more approach I want to mention that we have had quite some success with and that we think is um, important to keep in mind. When we do invest in these projects, we do it demand driven. So we never go out and say, now we are going to do a switch to this climate adapted crop in these areas. We set up the design in a way so there is a space for the communities, to the cooperatives, to the producer groups, to the women's group to discuss, okay, we have the opportunity of this product. It wants to co-invest with us. What do we want to invest in? And for them to be ready to come up with a small investment producer plans or whatever they want to call them in the adaptation plans or nutrition um, improving plans, what we often do is having these territorial approaches where people start to look at land use planning, but then combined with how do we plant the land use for resilience. And then you build these multi-stakeholder platforms at local levels where the different actors can come together with the municipalities that have some solution, the private sector that have other solutions, but you bring the small-scale producers at the table. So you have these kind of solutions where you try to sort out from below what doesn't work. And what do. So it can be the access to water. We need more investment in water. It can also be we need more investments in territorial markets. Where do we sell this food when we manage to increase our production? What are these market outlets? How do we link to value chains when that is an option? And how do we get better space for, for small-scale producers in, in local and regional market? There's a lot of regulations that comes into that. Small-scale producers can have difficulties with complying with food safety standard that is set for industrial production. Industrial production. When we work together with municipalities, we can find ways to have like flexibility in the regulation system so they can actually sell on local markets and not break any rules. So we have to always think around how do we integrate small-scale producers better in market so they can actually contribute to sustainable food system because they are the producers anyway, right? Um, so. Yes, so maybe the, the last thing I, I want to mention is when we, we do these territorial approaches, one new thing we are looking at now is not only what is happening with the natural resource and what is happening with the climate change risk and impacts, we also look at how does that territory look like as a food shed. So we're trying to use this new approach and build it into the discussions and the planning processes with the participation of small-scale producers that we have in rural areas. 
So what food is getting produced here? What food is missing? What are the nutrition gaps? Where could that come from, not come from? Who is processing and who is selling to which market? And who are the consumers who have the biggest needs of more access to affordable and nutritious food? So this is kind of a approach we are overlapping with the more natural resource management approach that we have done for years that is still needed, but we need to look at nutrition, overlapping it at the same time. So this is some of the things we also do with the partners out there. And finally, I think we have to rethink the way we think what is a beneficial investment. So what we're working on, every time we go out and do an investment with the government, we do the economic financial analysis, we look at what is the rate of return, and that's at what in economic terms, right? But how do we build in these more public goods that we need to look at to create sustainable food system that works for the rural poor? So building in other factors that also counts. How much nutrition do you actually generate and for which people if we do this investment? That needs to count in our economic financial analysis. And we need to find a way to get it into how we look at rate of return. What is a good rate of return? For what? For which future? Because we know we have big challenges and we need to rethink how do we get to a future where we have resilience and we can start to curb the, the emission as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for also highlighting the, the need to look at localities, to, lead, to look at lo territorial approaches. Also, Claudia mentioned to it, not just the national level, try to make it really uh, a local, local solution. And of course, the, the many, many other topics uh, you, you, you were so cleverly uh, integrated in your, uh, in your contribution. To me, it's striking that only 2% of the climate funds go to small-scale farmers, uh, producers. It's, it's like, what? With that, I'd really like to uh, turn to our next uh, speaker from WHO. Um, we know climate change is, is already uh, upon us. It's affecting people's health, and it will do so you know, in an even a, a quicker, higher speed rate unless we take ur urgent actions. So from a WHO perspective, could you please tell us a little bit more about that nexus between non-communicable diseases, health, nutrition, and climate change, and the importance of integrated nutrition uh, in adaptation and mitigation strategies? The floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the kind invitation to, to speak here. Um, and also, uh, thanks and apologies for the difficulties in handling these events. I think we're all sort of struggling with, with some of the, the circumstances. It, it reminds me of the the overall problems that we have in climate change and the, the solutions that we have, we either have to mitigate, adapt or suffer. And the more that we mitigate, the less we have to adapt, we're still going to suffer. Same with running events here. We'll try and fix the technical problems, we'll try and mitigate the issues, but the ones we can't do will adapt. There'll probably still be a little bit of suffering there, in, in there as well, but thanks all for your, uh, your patience on, on this. And I think um, the reason... Yeah, I think it's important for us to be here and, and to listen and, and learn is because many of us will talk about the importance of holistic approaches, the importance of breaking down silos, and it's a very easy thing to say, and everybody wants to do it, but it, it really matters when you're having to, when you're really trying to solve a problem, not just say we should all connect with one another. And from our point of view, our job at WHO and the health community is to try and protect people's health and at WHO, we, we only try and do three things. We try and protect people from nat natural disasters, sorry, from emergencies, disasters, pandemics, that's one. Second is provide universal health coverage, so provide health services to everybody. And then the third is to protect and promote health. And that third one, up until now, has been the one that's been rather neglected because we get judged on whether we can handle epidemics, whether people have health services and so on. The new signal from WHO is that is now priority number one. We're much more interested in people not having to go to the hospital or not having to deal with the pandemic after it's got, got out of the box. And within that, the, the, the overarching issue that we highlight is the climate crisis because it undermines everything else. So, and when we talk about protecting and promoting um, health, we talk about the determinants of health. And to take your idea of a no-brainer, to, to make this really simple, we say it's, it's air, it's clean, um, clean air, and that's why our pavilion is in the shape of human lungs, to emphasize you don't get clean air, you're dead in a few minutes. Water, water and sanitation, if you don't have access to that, you're dead in a couple of days. 
Next is nutrition in terms of urgency, and then shelter. And that, those are the, the, the elements that we boil the thing down to, and all of those are undermined by climate change. And nutrition is therefore obviously fundamentally important to human health. There's sometimes competition um, amongst uh, people trying to get access, uh, trying to get progress on their issue. If you want to uh, try and make progress on air quality, water and sanitation, uh, and so on. And so we often emphasize that about seven million people a year die from air pollution, a death every five minutes. Uh, malnutrition in all its forms is an even bigger burden. So it's both the, um, the impacts of undernutrition, uh, which is a, a disaster made worse by climate change, but it's also the massive chronic disease impacts of unhealthy diets. So it's absolutely critical that progress is made on nutrition and we would argue for that, even though it's maybe not in the headlines of what we do. We, we wish anybody who is um, working for safe, sustainable, healthy diets nothing but good wishes and our support because we can't protect health if they don't succeed. So that's one of the, the crit critical messages that we, we wanted to send. I think one of the other things that I've learned from uh, this the presentations and the earlier discussion is that we have many things in common. There are many parallels between what we're trying to do from a health entry point and from a nutri nutrition uh, entry point. Uh, and one of those um, is we all want coverage. You've just given the figures for lack of money going to the, the real, you know, the, the, the grassroots producers of, of food. And we all sort of point out that our, our sector, if you like, is in deficit. We, we point out that only half a percent of global climate finance has gone to health projects. I mean, I don't know where all the money is going, because it doesn't seem to be going to the good stuff. But, but you know, we, we all have those, uh, those, uh, those challenges. And yet, we, again, we all have to support each other, because uh, there is no point giving health 10% of the funds or whatever we want if nutrition doesn't get the support it needs because, again, there is no support for health. So, uh, there is no health. So we have, to, we have to support each other genuinely across all of these, uh, these, uh, these sectors. One of the other parallels that I see is that we also want, we want health in the NDCs in the same way that we think nutrition should be in the NDCs. Um, we also have to recognize that some of these mechanisms, we have to put the right things in the right places and not overburden them. So we are very pleased that on the health side, um, we, we monitor health in the NDCs. In the previous round, about 70% of NDCs mentioned health. We are very pleased that's up to 90%. Um, I'm also relatively pleased that the number of countries mentioning health adaptation in their NDCs has come down a little bit, because we're not sure that adaptation is, is the right health adaptation, the best place for it is not necessarily in the NDCs. We're really pleased that the NDCs are mentioning the health co-benefits of climate change mitigation through improved air quality, and we would also emphasize sustainable and healthy diets. And some of them, and, and there's also an increase in the numbers of uh, NDCs which quantify those. That's, that's going up as well. That's what we want to see. We want to see the right things in the right places mutually supporting each other. Just a final couple of, of comments from some of the really interesting stuff that was presented earlier is that it's clear that it's possible to get mitigation policy wrong, if you like, um, in terms of achieving some of the other things that you want to achieve. So we make the case that in general, climate change mitigation brings massive public health gains, but not if you don't do it right. And that is the, the lesson that seems to be coming through if you put a price on carbon. With, and I was waiting for you to explain the last bit of how we get out of this, that, that it seemed that everything that came from a price on carbon was bad. And I was very relieved that you said, uh, but if you play, put into place the social protection measures, then it can work. And we see that on the health side as well. We would generally argue for a tax on carbon and a tax on pollution, but we know from the case studies, from the experiences, if you just do that and you don't put the resources into other good things like health, education, and so on, the political backlash will be huge. You, it'll completely undermine what you're trying to do. So that was a real parallel that I took from what you were describing. So I think, I, I think maybe that's, that's pretty much where I wanted to, to leave it, other than to say that 
Um, I was also really interested that you presented the slide on climate solutions from the IPCC. We use that, that slide a lot. We emphasize the food part of it. We also emphasize things like sustainable transport systems, cuts air pollution, boosts physical activity, and so on. Uh, reduced waste, renewable energy gives you lots of, of health benefits. But I, I think um, we apply the same kind of lens that you need to, to quantify and you need to take account of all of the other good or bad things that will come from, it, from in, in, introducing your mitigation policy and have a smart design of your policy so that we don't undermine the action on mitigation by pointing out the, the, the bad things, but how, whether we, can, we aim to design a policy that makes clear that in general we have to decarbonize we, if we do it right, we'll get these, these co-benefits, but we have to do it right, and here are the details of getting it right. Thank you so much. Indeed, we have to do it right. And going back to what Claudia mentioned in the beginning, if we don't see the linkages, we might get it wrong. So if we do see the linkages, we get it right. So thank you so much. I'd like to, to go now to the, to the next panel. Uh, we are a bit behind schedule, but I hope at the end we will have some questions from the floor, if possible. So can I call on uh, Florian Waldschmidt, who is the Senior Program Associate and Climate Analytics of uh, United Nations University. And can I also invite um, uh, Professor Ronit Endeveld from the Ministry of Health in, uh, in Israel. And online, we would have uh, Ms. Bibi uh, Jossi, who is the Senior Advisor of Food and Nutrition Security. I hope we, do have, we don't have Bibi online. Well, we'll try again later. We first go to the, to the other two panelists. So I'd like to ask you, both of you, a question. I guess you were expecting that. And you would have, instead of the five minutes you promised, I promised you we'll have only three minutes. Otherwise, we really don't have time for questions to the audience. So, yes, we, are, we need to adapt, and we need to mitigate the problems. Indeed, yes. So, uh, Florian, to start with you. Uh, climate change is exacerbating extreme events around the world. We can see that. Um, and that has a negative impact on agriculture production, including livestock, including fisheries. Uh, it it uh, decreases biodiversity and it leads to increased food insecurity. So, can you tell us about solutions? Solutions from your climate analytics perspectives at the Institute for Environment and Human Security. Over to you. Thank you very much, yeah, and, and as I said, we have to adapt quickly, I like that note. <laughs> um, yeah, from my, from my climate analytics, risk analytics perspective, it's, uh, which is my, my primary field, I have to say that um, although, although there are many goals and adaptation goals defined in the NDCs as well as in the NAPs, um, we have to, to, to implement and to reach those goals to ensure the progress made towards food security we need to understand and, and be able to quantify our food risk. Because only, only once, once we quantify our risk, I think, from our perspective, we can, we can proactively um, apply or make the decision for the right adaptation measure. I know there's not the one right, but there's probably one that is more cost beneficial than the other. And I want to, to go into one example of one of our studies that we have done at the Institute um, to quantify food risk. That was in, in Eastern Ethiopia some two or three years ago where we quantified how many animals, how many, um, yeah, how many square meters of land, of cropland, as well as of natural resources are probably affected um, in 2050 under different um, climate scenarios. And of course, we can quantify that in, in monetary terms. I think it came out to about 130 million US dollars of expected uh, loss in, on livestock. But what does it mean for, for food insecurity? What does it mean for food supply? Well, we can translate that easily into how many animals, how many tropical livestock units, and you can go on, right? You can translate that into kilograms of meat and, and nutritional value. Actually, I brought some numbers, right? It says uh, 230,000 animals. I um, don't want to bring you more numbers since we are uh, uh, short on time. But now that we know the food risk, we can look into different adaptation measures tackling 
those, those issues on, on all those three areas that I mentioned, livestock, crop, as well as uh, natural resources, including biodiversity. And we can run cost-benefit analyses, really taking a close look there. And, and it turned out, actually, that um, adaptation measures supporting uh, the bridging of, of fodder supply, especially, but also the support of biodiversity, so storage of, of food, uh, fodder, as well as management of environmental areas, wetland restoration and rehabilitation were the most cost-efficient measures. So it's not always uh, gray measures that, that work towards food supply, food security, but it's actually those, those supporting systems, ecosystem services. And with that then, I think this, um, coming back to, to the introduction of yours earlier, this really, now, now we have something tangible in hand to unlock climate finance, to unlock food supply, food security finance, and, and find the right solutions. I think. That was wonderful, and I, if I may, I mean, you, you, from an adaptation point of view, you connected beautifully with uh, the speaker from, from IFAD, who also said we need that uh, return on investment, we need to know, we need to know what we are doing. It was also mentioned by, by Claudia, let's, let's look a little bit deeper, and your analysis show, like, okay, this is the costs, and these are the returns on investment, and some of them are more efficient or give more returns on investment than others. And that's exactly what we need to look at in order to do good and in order to do not bad. So with that, I'd like to go to Professor Ronit Endeveld. So if I may, um, could you tell us a little bit more about the nutritional guidelines uh, and much program in your country that is in, implemented by, uh, by your ministry and particularly how that one is helping us to pursue mutually reinforcing nutrition and environmental goals. The floor is yours. Try to stick to your three minutes. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak here. Uh, I enjoyed very much the previous lectures and I think our main uh, uh, challenge now is to move from our expectations and our uh, guidelines into practical life. Because at the end, we need that the people will do what we recommend. And that's the most difficult thing to do. So we wrote the nutritional guidelines based on expert and, and scientific research. And uh, in the guidelines, we made part also the sustainability part. It's about nutrition, sustainability, physical activity, social and cultural adapted, and, uh, and also um, economically adapted, because we have to think of all the aspects when we speak about nutrition. And when we wrote the nutritional guidelines, we figured out that we don't want it to be stayed alone in the site of the internet, uh, but we want people to know it. So we use the front of pack labeling, in order to sign all the products that are green for you. They are according to the nutritional guidelines. And all those products are mainly, uh, mainly uh, vegetables, uh, plant-based food, less uh, uh, animal origin, and no ultra-processed food at all. So we have those guidelines also published. We had it uh, international published in an international journal in order to have other countries doing the same. Another thing that we did is that we, were, we, we used a system close to the Chilean way uh, of the judgmental front of pack labeling and we put the red labeling over products that have high sugar, high fat, uh, high sugar, high fat and uh, in a high salt in order that people will locate the ultra processed food at the supermarket at the state of the supermarket I can show it to you here it looks like that and you can uh, see it it's on the cover of the package it's a very simplific sign everybody can understand it um, and and whoops and we showed already there was a decrease of around 20%, 20-25% of purchasing products that have red labeling. Another issue that's happened is that uh, uh, all the factories, the industrial uh, food uh, industries, uh, did a lot of reformulation. They lowered the amount of sugar, salt, 
and the fat, and saturated fat in the products marginally. Also, the chains of supermarkets that also produce food, they, they also reduce the amount of salt, sugar, and saturated fat. So people are eating now in Israel much less sugary products without knowing there was a change in the reformulation. That was another step. Another thing that we did, that we launched the tax for a sweet and sweetened beverages, and it also have an impact on climate, because it's all, you, you know, uh, these plastic bottles and everything. So there was a huge influence on purchase of uh, sweet beverages, like around 17%. But now, as to a political uh, uh, change, they want to stop the tax. So we don't know what will happen. It will be an ecological study to see what's happened after you take off the tax. Uh, it's amazing, uh, unbelievable, and that's why I don't have a voice for the last 10 years, 10, 10 new days. But uh, uh, I think it's wrong, but uh, it, it's a poli it's political argument, and it's not a health argument. And I think uh, the voice of health on NCDs, NCT together, like uh, you said before, is critical, is critical to join them together. And we speak a lot about cultivated meat. And we are quite, uh, quite conscious about it because we really don't know what it is. We know how they now are going to produce them. They are, most of them are ultra-processed meat. We don't know the influence on health. We all admire it. It looks like high tech, I know, 10 seconds. But we have to take care and see that it won't turn to be trans fatty acids. So we all have to think very thoroughly when we enter those new products to our dairy products or our national guidelines or, or our general nutrition because we really don't know what it is. It is a lot of products. It seems very innovative, but in every slide that I see in this conference, I see cultivated meat. But no one knows what it is. If it would be a medication, no one will sell us a medication without 20 years of experience on people. And with cultivated meat, we're going to eat it next, week, next year. So we have to be very cautious. Thank you very much. Sorry? Cultivated meat you can buy today in Singapore. So chicken nuggets cultivated. Yeah, but it's going very fast. It's, it's not that bad. So there's, there's a lot of uh, opportunities and challenges and linking and learning from, from each other. So excellent. Thanks a lot for your, uh, for your insight. So what we, we have heard a few global insights from WHO and IFAD. We have heard a few country examples from the, from the two of you. I just need to check quickly if BB Josie has joined us online. No? Okay, then it's really a pity. Uh, but then on the other hand, we do have a, an opportunity for a few questions from the floor. So can I just check for hands? Yeah, I see one hand there and one hand in the back. So if you can ver try to... There's a second one. So try to have a, a brief, brief question and please indicate to whom you are asking the question. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yep. So very quickly, congratulations for the panel. Very insightful. I would like to hear a little bit more. Uh, sorry, I forgot your name. <laughs> About speci specifically how, to, how you are addressing the sustainability part of the guidelines. We are from Brazil. We have similar process within our dietary guidelines. So I would like to hear a little bit more from you, how you are acknowledging the sustainable part into the dietary guidelines. That, that's a good question. I also had wanted to ask that one. But I saw another question in the back. So if you can hand the question to the back. Uh, if you can also be very brief with your question. Sure. Thank you. Uh, basically, um, yeah, congratulations for the panel. Uh, basically, it's a comment. Um, that, uh, I mean, this has been mentioned by uh, the army that uh, probably the NDCs is not the best place 
tu adres nutrition or tu adres diets um, still the national adaptation plans there are only 26 percent of countries all of them they have malnutrition in all these forms that have not even mentioned uh, diets of nutrition and those are national adaptation plans so it's a, it's a comment that the adaptation part of the uh, NDCs is conditional to funding and is not the best place for that and for diets um, I mean following the the, the, uh, the lead of uh, Sweden that is uh, uh, providing volunteering uh, guidelines for emissions and consumption emissions. This is a lead that uh, you need all the countries to uh, agree to the IPCC, to, to propose to the IPCC to develop the uh, guidelines for greenhouse uh, inventories, greenhouse gases inventories, in order for them to start to work in guidelines, methodology, etc., and to put diets or to integrate diets in the mitigation part of the NDC. So it was just a comment. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we have been uh, in the Food System Summit. We have done this analysis and we will be very happy to follow up uh, with you on this. Thank you. Excellent questions. So I'm checking whom of the panel would like. There was one address to you. You also want to comment? Yeah, okay. And then, of course, we have two more experts in the room. Uh, thanks the Brazilian question. Uh, I must say that uh, the Brazilian guidelines were also part of uh, what we were looking for when we started writing the Okay, you hear now? Okay. Uh, what I said is that the Brazilian guidelines was a part of uh, what we looked for when we started writing our guidelines. And Carlos Monterio, which is a very famous uh, a researcher in Brazil, was a part of our colleagues that we consult with him very much with our guidelines. And I must say that uh, um, the, the green labeling is uh, mainly on natural foods, fruits, vegetables, lentils, nuts, uh, not only packaged foods, but also open market foods have the green labeling. It, it, we, we started looking at the Nordic keyhole at the beginning, but the keyhole also give green labeling on ultra processed food. And we didn't want to give on ultra processed food the green labeling. So that was the way to convince uh, our committee, the scientific committee, on which products to, to put the green labeling. Our nutritional guidelines also speak about sustainability. It does it, and it follows the Eat Lancet guidelines uh, on the mainly plant-based diet. So it's mainly plant-based diet with a little bit of uh, uh, food from animal source, and then it's also mainly natural. And the cultivated meat, as, as I spoke before, is now a big, a big challenge. We don't say it's not good, we don't say it's good, but we said we have to make a big question mark as if it contributes to our uh, sustainability or not, if it's good for our health or not, and it has to be checked. Like every other new product that we enter our dish, what, what's happening the last 70 years that 50 to 60 percent of our diet now is ultra processed food. It's food that 100 years ago no one ate. Most of the food that children are eating are snacks. Most of the calories are from sweet beverages and energy drinks. And, and we have a huge problem of obesity. And we speak here all those days about uh, the climate change, but we have to speak about people also in the same part, because malnutrition is all over in, on both sides. Underweight, overweight, obesity, sarcopenia, we have it all over. And we have to take care of good nutrition, and not to forget that it's crucial. Okay. Anyone of the other panelists would like to add? No? Okay. So, if we do not have any other questions, online questions? No, no online questions. Probably that's...
maybe the battery is a little bit down. So we adapt to that one. I see one more question. <laughs> this one is working. Thank you so much. Just a point of reflection as, um, so my name is Simona Wydensko. I work with the United Nations in the Pacific, covering Pacific uh, small island developing states. We have a series of challenges ahead of us. So one of the challenges is that those policies at the country level are not necessarily always integrated. So there is no um, lens through which a uh, climate change lens through which other public policies are being defined. So obviously it's a common effort that they need to make together to make that happen. The second point is that the financing architecture that we are drawing on does not necessarily allow this multi-sectoral approach. So we still have financing instruments that look into different topics on our agenda, although we have agreed together that the 2030 agenda is totally integrated. But that's not necessarily a very rapid, natural process of alignment at the country level. So not necessarily a question, but just to flag that there is a lot more work that we need to do together, considering how short the time frame it is. And for small island states, it's even shorter to ensure that policy um, is all integrated, understanding that climate change is defining the new reality in which we all operate. And also, as the reform of the multilateral development banks is on the table right now, and of the financial architecture in G20 this coming week, there is a stimulus, SDG stimulus, a uh, new vision that is going to be presented by the United Nations. Just together we need to push for a financing architecture that supports this integration and that allows governments to make progress. Planning at the country level is very solid. Um, countries have learned a lot. It's just that this is implementation, this COP27. When we move to implementation, we need to make sure that we are all uh, working on the same track. Thank you. And thanks to WHO and to IFAD and to all of the other colleagues for great work in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you for those, uh, those reflections. Um, I, I will share very brief my, my own reflections, but in fact I should not do it because you, you already did it. You did it cleverly, I mean pointing out the urgency. I mean it is urgent, climate change is there and, and maybe me personally I'm living in an area where yes, I do notice it's happening, but in your case it's, 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 it's urgent, it's ha I mean the water is, 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 um, is threatening your, your life and your, your livelihoods. So. I just came from another event where I said that we, we all called on the negotiators to take this extremely seriously and we do have solutions at hand, we do have analytics, of course we can do better and we should go from my no-brainers in the beginning to the brainers that Claudio, uh, Claudia and others uh, contributed uh, with, but we need to act now. We need to take those solutions, like the, the taxes on sugary drinks. It, that, that's indeed a no-brainer. You know, do it immediately. There are some areas that we still can explore a little bit more. Yes, so let's do that. But in the meantime, let's do those things that we can do already and don't wait for it. Mm -hmm. And let's really start to include in the national determined contributions and in the national adaptation plans those elements of which we know they can work. Uh, we have to do that, and, and if we are not thinking from our own comfortable area, like I'm here and I'm doing X and you're there and you're doing Y, no, we should really combine and do those combined interlinked packages in the NDCs, in the National Action Plan, so it works. And we do not have the negative impact if we could, the risk for a negative impact if we only take into account one, one aspect. So really connecting the dots. So with that, I'd like to close this event and really thank the audience and also the listeners uh, online. Was there a final question? Oh, I hadn't seen you. I, I apologize. I'm looking at my watch because I, I also need to go to another event myself. But you can... 
I'll make it super quick. Leslie Mitchell from Forum for the Future. I just wanted to thank you, Stenica, for um, the amount of work that you've done to try and bridge the gaps across these different environments of climate and agriculture and food and health. Um, I just wanted to offer three very quick endpoints um, from here the uh, reflections from these conversations. I think the first is that we need to do more to understand the language of the other actors who are coming from other sectors if we're going to bridge and work together and particularly those who are working within the climate environment and we need to have that space to come together to do that. Um, secondly is the context specificity of the kinds of actions and implementation we suggest because the world as you've said for somebody who is living in a developing country and relying for example on livestock for their nutrition is going to be very different to somebody in an over consuming highly ultra processed environment um, but the third thing for me and this was kind of going to be my question is if you are someone from this climate background and you want to start to understand the implications of nutrition for the ND season and also what you could do at a national and a global level is there yet anywhere to find that information to build their own capacity? And if not, could we flag that as something that's an absolute priority to build? I don't, I don't know if I should take the liberty to try and answer that question. Um, maybe not. And, and then I am going to run and just leave it to my panelists to also try and add to that. I think it's extremely difficult to, to find, to get one place to find all that information. Um, we, as, as you are nutrition, we try to uh, build that narrative and bring the several elements together, not just from the U several UN agencies and the, the involvement and the development in the knowledge, of the knowledge in the several agencies to be hosted on, on our, our website that we are currently, you know, building and, and, and fueling with this kind of information. But, but you know, it's, it's, it's not something like this. So you need to be continuously learning, adapting <laughs> to the changing context in order to be coherent and consistent. So that one place you're looking for will also be changing all the time. So I can say, I, I, in fact, I said that we are building such a, a place, such a location of that information, that knowledge, knowledge for action, I would say. But I, I call on all of you, please continue the learning because this thing, climate change, is happening and it's changing our lives, it's changing our livelihoods, it's changing the opportunities we have for our livelihoods, as we heard from the several contribution. It's changing what we can eat and what we have to eat. Um, so it, we need to continue that, that learning experience together. And I'll, I'll stop there and I wish you a wonderful day and I hope this COP will be successful for all of us. Thank you so much.
Hi everyone, my name is Bea, I'm a medical doctor from Switzerland and I'm part of the International Federation of Medical Students Associations who are here today to give you a 30 minutes insight at the beginning for our today's session Food for Health and Sustainability from the Youth Perspective. We are the voice of 1.3 million medical students worldwide. So we are here as the voice of all future doctors around this globe who came here to this climate conference because the climate emergency is the single biggest threat to human health. And a huge part of our health is food, right? All of you, one of the first things you did today was eating. And I just want to invite you to come on a little journey with me. I invite you all to close your eyes. Just close your eyes and take a deep breath. And now we're doing a journey into a healthy and green future. On such a day when you're in this utopia, when you wake up, what does this future look like? Are you sleeping in a room? Are you maybe having a big window towards nature? When you get up and go to the kitchen and you open the fridge, is it a fridge? How does the food look like that is inside? What would you like to eat? How is the taste of this food? How do you prepare the food? What kind of, kind of food is fueling you to lead a healthy life? When you go outside and you look on the street, what do you see? Do you see a city? Do you see just street and asphalt? Do you see trees? Maybe you see urban gardening? Do you see fields? Do you see animals? Do you see plants? So you walk through the street, you th walk through the outside and just soak up everything that is around you. What is your deepest source to give you energy? What makes your healthy life thrive in this future? And I invite you to come back to the present moment. We're not there yet at this very nice place. And we're in a situation where the climate emergency is currently on the brink of escalating. Many places on our planet, and it's unfortunately the only planet we're having, are on the risk of getting hotter and hotter so that we cannot produce food anymore. Food is central to fuel our life. And it's not something separate from us. Humans are not separate from nature and our health depends on the health of the animals, of the plants, of the trees, of the ecosystems. This is what we call planetary health. And this is what the Lancet has been doing with the planetary health diet, the big report they did in 2019, where they came up with a diet saying how can we nurture all the people around this globe in a healthy and sustainable way. And it is my honor to now hand on to my colleagues, to medical students from all around the world who have come here to give you their insights on how we can make these huge transformations happen, how we can move from the status quo, standing here at COP27, in the middle of the desert. I don't know how you have been eating the past days, but I think most of us have not been drinking enough water and not been eating healthy food here because it's very hard to find and it's very expensive, not accessible to everyone. So how can we move from here today how, towards a transformation for a healthy future within the planetary boundaries? And with this, I would like to hand over the mic to Juliette. She's a six-year medical student from the Netherlands and she will give you the first insights. Next slide, please.
Thank you so much, uh, Bea. I don't know how I can follow uh, up on this. But we first wanted to share with you like a brief overview of the link between impact of the uh, food systems on climate change, how we can use our diets actually to move forward to a healthier and more sustainable future. But also, after that, my colleague will talk uh, to you about how climate change is affecting food security in the end and that we maybe as a health community have a responsibility into addressing uh, or solving these interlinked problems. So next slide. Um, yes, so food in this Anthropocene age represents one of the greatest health uh, and environmental challenges but also opportunities. Next slide. And what are the two biggest uh, themes that are also maybe being discussed during this COP in the agricultural text uh, is livestock that uses a lot of water and land on our earth, but it's also the food waste. And the numbers are in the next slides. So about the livestock, what we see is that current farming accounts for 14.5% from all global emissions. So that's a huge amount. And also, um, 29% of the greenhouse gas emissions originate from our current food system. So working with this food system and making it more sustainable is a huge opportunity for climate action as well as health. Next slide. And about the food waste, this is huge as well. Uh, of all the food that we eat uh, on our plates and in our uh, food processing system, uh, we waste one third. So this is obviously a strange paradox, still having hunger in the world and wasting one third of what we are producing. And when you look at the global answers to the climate crisis, you see that food is in number two, uh, number three and number four of the most impactful climate solution. Reducing food waste is solution number three to solving the climate crisis. Eating plant-rich diets, uh, that means more vegetables and less uh, meat, uh, is solution number four. This is stated in uh, drawdown. Um, next slide. And moreover, what we also see, you can click one more time for the numbers, is that our current agricultural system is also using a lot of water. So 70% 70, uh, 70 of the worldwide water is used in our agricultural system. And also, next slide, we see a lot of deforestation happening uh, due to uh, current agriculture. So our agricultural area is representing more, of more or less 40% of um, the entire uh, global land on Earth. And from that uh, 37%, 70% is used for pasture. So again, livestock plays an important role in the current use of land as well, which is one of the planetary boundaries. Next slide. And therefore, um, we also see that um, the production of agriculture is a major, um, is pushing forward also for deforestation in the Amazon. And from the current uh, cutting of the trees, we see again that 40% is in the pasture side. Um, next slide. Okay. So luckily it's not all bad because we have opportunities. This is from the Eat Lancet Commission report. And I think this accounts for actually all the climate action that we can be taking. So we can go, go for a lose-lose option in which we choose uh, unhealthy futures and unlivable futures. We can go for a lose-win, for example, that we choose for health but not to stay within the planetary boundaries or vice versa. Or in the best possible options, we go for a win-win. So we choose a future that is livable for all, which is healthier for all, and which is more equal to all. Next slide. I think this is about my country. Yes. So this is um, an example from my own country in the Netherlands. We have, which is called um, the Schijf van Vijf, which means there are five areas you should get everything of. So one is fruit and vegetables, one is uh, fibers, uh, water, meat, fish, and um, how do you say it? Cheese. Uh, but actually what we see in our current recommendations, we see that this uh, diet that's only based on health and not on sustainability, and this might also be something that's happening in your country, that your national guidelines on food do not include the sustainable future. So maybe this is a great win for us as a scientific community, a health community, people working in the food system to, have, uh, to create guidelines that are actually including a sustainable future into them. I think you can click two times 
Yes, so not this. Um, next slide. So obviously the Lancet has created um, a very um, comprehensive research about what is an alternative to uh, the old diet. And they created a plate in which you can still include some meat or uh, animal products, but the main thing on the plate is plant-based. And it's also adapted to several regions around the world, so they created options for um, many of us. Next slide. Yes, so this is an example. I think this is, again, for Mike region an example and next slide is about uh, the, put the, the health uh, opportunities that are in there yes so depending on how you calculate those health benefits we can gain um, between 10.8 and 11.6 million adult deaths per year so there is a huge health potential in making our food systems more sustainable as well next slide so what we need is action. Uh, without action, the world is failing to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goal targets and the Paris Agreement. Um, there is, today, there is still hunger. Uh, today, we have many preventable diseases, uh, and that is kind of paradoxical. So I invite you to think along in the next conversation uh, in how we can move to a healthy and sustainable future. And that was it for me, I think. Next slide. Yes, so I am very honored to uh, ask forward uh, Mikolai, who is uh, also from the International Federation of Medical Students Association, a sixth-year medical student from Poland, who will tell uh, more to us about the impact of climate change on food and nutrition. Uh, thank you, Juliette. My name is Mikolai Patalong. Indeed, I am from, uh, I'm a medical, final me medical student from Poland. And now I would like to shortly introduce the topic of the impact of climate change on food and nutrition. Uh, food for Health and Sustainability is a major topic for IFMSA. This year, our federation published a major policy document specifying exactly that uh, topic. We talked about multiple issues, including the double burden of uh, malnutrition, but we also, for the first time, underlined the connection between climate change, its effects, uneven effects, when we take into account all the, all the parts of the world, uh, with this, on the situation of food uh, security on nutrition. And next slide, please. Uh, as we know, climate change is already impacting food security around the world, especially in low and middle income countries um, in, Asia, in the region of Asia, Pacific and um, in Africa. And as the cri crisis is due to progress, we are going to see extreme weather events, we're going to see uh, reduced water supplies, uneven water supplies, taking into, into account um, the year. And it's going to lead to significant falls in the crop yields and sadly increased food prices. And together with other uh, international factors like uh, military conflicts, it's all going to uh, mostly first affect the low and middle income countries, but the increased food prices are going to, um, are going to impact the entire world because the market is global and um, we're, going to, we're going to see every single community affected. Uh, what's more, as uh, the sea level will rise due to climate change, we will see two effects. The first effect, um, less severe, one could say, will be that there will be floodings. There will be floodings on the seaside and uh, del in the del delta regions of the world. And we are going to see uh, the, the most, the uppermost layer of s soil being washed away by the flood, which will result in a worse uh, conditions for uh, growing any crops. On the other hand, we're also going to see in the exact same regions, so in the delta regions and uh, the, the seaside regions, those regions will be affected by, um, will, be, will find themselves underwater at some point. And those regions are heavy when it comes to population and also heavy when it comes to uh, the amount of uh, food produced. Finally, um, insects, weeds and other um, species we would, that we would not like to see uh, affecting our, um, our crops will uh, increase their presence, which will again lead to a uh, food crisis. Next slide, please. Um, as we know already, billions of people are facing uh, undernutrition and that number is going to significantly uh, increase over the next decades. And it all depends upon um, our climate action, our commitment to it, to what extent. 
Also, uh, military conflict, as the climate crisis pr uh, goes on to progress, mi mil new military conflicts, new military hotspots are going to pop up all over the world. And they're going to focus mainly on uh, arable land. So again, the Delta regions uh, already affected, but also um, on the sources of drinkable water. Uh, on the other hand, that's something which might be missed by many, but um, unbalanced diets are going to lead to non-communicable diseases, also obesity, because that's all, there's also a connection here, and also um, people might be impacted by micronutrient deficiencies. As uh, in the case of every food insecurity uh, episode, and any food crisis, people will um, go to consume the food they have, the, the food they can afford that kind of food might not be fully nutritious. So um, a good example of that will be zinc. Um, and it's been already proven scientifically that um, plants, that crops, if the CO2 level in the atmosphere rises, there is like um, a chemical process which leads to many micronutrients being less absorbed from the soil by many of the crops. And uh, in the end, it's, it, it might end up, especially in vulnerable populations, we might see uh, a higher incidence of um, deficiencies. Finally, um, we are, as I, as I mentioned already, this crisis is going to affect every single country, even the countries that feel safe, the global north, because of the global food markets. And uh, now with the, with, with the crisis in Europe, we see that um, one minor event brings major consequences and multiple minor and major events like climate change are going to really um, impact our world and change it for, for the worse if we don't do anything. Next slide, please. Um, now some numbers to illustrate. So by 2030, according to FAO, we're going to see um, a need to increase food production by 60% if we want to meet um, like the demand of the, of the rising population. Sadly, we're going to see the most of the rise in the low and middle income countries. So the exact countries which are already majorly affected. Um, that, that will have to, uh, this scenario takes into account the medium uh, rise in population. So, it all, so if, if the higher projections, if the, like, the, the, mo the mo most negative projections come into fruition, we're going to see an even uh, greater demand. Uh, already more than 3 billion people, so it's like 40% of the global population, um, cannot afford a fully nutritious diet. So they can, sometimes they meet the uh, demand for energy, but they don't meet the, uh, the already mentioned demand for micronutrients, uh, for protein. That's also, that's also uh, a problem. So by 2030, the same um, deadline, we're going to see the risk of hunger and malnutrition around the world uh, rise by 20%. So in the already impacted vulnerable communities, it's going to be even worse because that's the, that's the average. Um, and in the countries, and that's, that's a good example of what's happening now because climate change is always mentioned, oh, it's something that will impact us in the future. No, it's already um, bearing its uh, brunt. Uh, in the countries of Sub-Saharan Africa, there have been over the past years, maybe even decades, there have been uh, major events in terms of um, drought, and uh, those events have led to um, between 20, uh, 20 and 60 percent of livestock dying. And that impacts not only um, food supply chains in those uh, regions, in those countries, but also it impacts livelihoods. So those farmers in those regions uh, lose their livelihood. And now I am very proud to announce the next person to lead our presentation today. Her name is Marian Benazus. She's a final year medical student from Morocco, and I give you the floor. Thank you so much, Mikulai. Uh, after all these presentations, <laughs> I don't know how to proceed, but I will try to do my best. Uh, because uh, acknowledging all these important facts and this urgency that we are facing, I know that urgency is repeated quite often in this <laughs> cup, <laughs> but uh, this is why we have the SDGs and this is how, why we need to act. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, basically, our next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, basically, here what I want to present from a uh, youth perspective. Um, in IFMSA, one of our motto is to think 
um, globally act locally. So um, basically here, um, the first thing that I want to enhance or to make uh, a point on is the empowerment of those communities. We don't often think about uh, the people who are on the... Um, on the spot, for example, there are some populations where women don't work, but they are next to um, um, a fertile um, uh, land. So maybe why don't we empower them and give them a way to have uh, these initiatives that will be both uh, eco-friendly and uh, eco-friendly economically? but also eco-friendly for our environment. And this will um, also uh, help the development of these countries that are still needing some help. So why don't, them, why don't they help their own citizens and help themselves? Also, we need to build capacity um, not only within these agricultures, but also within the health community. Because um, I'm not sure about you, but I don't think that I have been formed and I have been uh, educated enough about nutrition and its importance or about One Health and how we can uh, collaborate as a health community or sorry, uh, or uh, how we can uh, ensure that our patients are educated enough to balance their, their, um, their nutrition. We are in a world where fast foods and where everything is easier, where uh, access to fats and uh, unbalanced diets are sadly easier, cheaper than a balanced diet. So maybe raising awareness and uh, sharing this knowledge with the uh, general population is uh, at the utmost importance. Uh, then we need research. Why do we need research? Because we don't have enough data, especially in developing countries and low and middle uh, income countries. We don't have enough data about the link of climate change and, um, and uh, food insecurity. We don't have enough data about how climate change is impacting uh, the quality of food. We don't have um, uh, enough uh, data about the situation that we have and how um, uh, unsafe access to, uh, to safe food uh, is impacting their population and to safe water. Because we are um, in the urge, uh, we saw it with COVID-19, of emerging diseases, uh, of um, diseases that have been eradicated and that are threatening to come back because of the unsanitary, unsanitary um, access to food or water. So um, now I think that it's time to act, it's time to advocate, and it's also time to preserve our natural resources. Because of the mistakes that we did in the past, uh, we are destroying nature to um, give more um, more um, land to agriculture without preserving our, our nature. We are deforesting uh, important forests. Uh, we are destroying biodiversity. So we need now to act on it and to uh, put pressure on our government to, to take the responsibility and to have a sustainable strategy uh, to both ensure safe access to food and water while protecting our planet. Because uh, in the next days, if we don't act, we will lose both our planet, our food, and our, our sex access to water. We need also to include youth in the future uh, decision making. Why? Because they, uh, they might not be aware of what's happening and what is uh, pending to them, maybe uh, a war because of access to water or to fruits or to basic, um, to basic uh, nutrients. We need to act now, we need to educate, we need to empower, uh, we need to research in order to have an evidence-based strategy in the national, uh, local, regional and international level. Um, this is uh, it for me and uh, hopefully after this COP we will not be only speaking about text and decision and negotiations but we will indeed act and contribute to change the world and meet in the next COP28 uh, uh, with uh, results and with uh, an impact. This is the COP of impact, this is the COP of implementation and hopefully next year we will have the COP of evaluation and a new way forward. Um, so now I will pass again my, the mic to our dear uh, Bia, who is a, medic um, a medical doctor from Switzerland, currently in Germany, fighting for the environment as a medical doctor and uh, active activist, uh, who presented the introduction and now will conclude. On, uh, uh, so I will let you with the, the amazing activist, Leah. 
Thank you very much, Miriam, Juliette, and Nikolai, for these very insightful introductions into the topic. I think we now know how urgently the transformations are needed, right? And often when we talk about food, even if we see the food on our plate, we don't know what is linked to the whole food chain, right? And just imagine going to the supermarket, and the next time when you buy meat or beef, just imagine taking also all the waste that is associated, like the tons, tons of waste that the cows are producing, that you just get not only the price tag for the meat, but also the price tag for all the waste of the cows with them, like the tons and tons of waste. We don't see that in the supermarkets, um, but I think it's important to, when we, when, we f when we see the food, that we think about what is coming before, right? And one thing that I did, for example, in Switzerland, I took the recommendations of the Lancet EAT report and I compared them to the national guidelines. So we have the plate of the Lancet EAT and we have the plate of the Swiss national guidelines. I don't have them here, unfortunately, but I can only recommend you to do the same thing. Check out your national guidelines on nutrition and compare them to the Lancet Eat report. Do the two plates look the same? And then just think about what governments, also medical doctors, are still prescribing and recommending their patients as a healthy diet. And think about why we're not there yet. Because we don't distribute the correct information, right? And the strategies that are being used currently that are hindering food transformation to happen. Of the meat industry, of the milk industry, there's very good evidence that these are the same strategies that tobacco industries have been using and fossil fuels industry are using. And so we are not in front of this huge barrier, so why is this transformation not happening? We're so powerless. But we as healthcare professionals, we are experts in identifying the strategies of tobacco companies, right? So it's just very, very rich companies using very powerful strategies to hinder this transformation to happen and to hinder life to be protected. So instead of feeling hopeless, we can build upon what we have been identifying over the past decades, what we have learned from the tobacco industry, and use that for the meat, for the milk industry, and for the fossil fuel industry in order to the huge transformation to happen. And this was from our side. As the medical students, as the future voice of all doctors, we hope that the doctors of the future will recommend healthy nutrition, will not be falsed by f the current lobbying, lobbying and strategies, but will give out evidence-based recommendations so that the future we envisioned at the beginning will become every day more reality. It was an honor and I will hand over to the next speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So I think our speakers can come on stage. So now we are continuing with, uh, with the panel. Uh, but first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting figure and fact, so I hope we can get it afterwards. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, what I would like to, to do is to let you introduce yourself uh, shortly, so I don't have to do a bio of uh, five minutes of it. <laughs> and then you can also answer my question if that's fine with you. So yeah, we are continuing on the topic of uh, food for health and sustainability from the youth perspective. And we have uh, today um, speakers with all different expertise and backgrounds on the topics we are tackling. So Mohamed, I would like to start with you. Uh, would you like to start explaining us why is public health so important when it comes to nutrition?
Yes, it's it's working now. Okay. So uh, yeah, I introduced myself as well, right? Or no? I don't know. I think this is cop right now, like just a metaphor. Yes, so yeah, now it's working. That was an entrance, so yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, just move this. Okay. So, yes, my name is Mohammed. I'm an American student from Egypt and the liaison officer for public health issues at the IFMSA as well. Uh, so, why it's linked very much the nutrition and food systems to public health. When we get to speak about public health and what it actually means, it's about organized efforts by all stakeholders in order to prevent disease, prolong life, and promote the health in general. And that's what actually we can do with food systems. Food systems and nutrition is something that we do in every, our everyday lives, and it's affected by many different determinants. It's affected by social determinants, economic determinants, environmental determinants, that as what we're living in the moment, the climate crisis, and even affected by behavioral and cultural and traditions, I would say, that would impact also how we consume food and how do we even produce food. So I believe when we speak about public health, as a medical student, it's not just about treating the diseases caused by the unhealthy diets or the unhealthy lifestyles but it's about more about prevention preventing these unhealthy lifestyles preventing these unhealthy diets and focusing more on the food systems transformation and that's why we f we like the the title of the session it was food for health and sustainability because here if we mean for example the human health we're asking for human health and sustainability and i would even make it more like wider it's more of the planetary health and it's more of a one health approach in which we take care of the environment, we take care of the humans, in which we take care of the animals, and we make sure that we're living in a cohesive ecosystem that takes care of each and every one of it. So I believe that's why public health is very much relevant to what we do, and it's not just about treatment, but it's about prevention, and prevention is also about focusing on determinants, and that's why public health is very much important when it comes to working on uh, the transformation of food systems and tackling the nutrition as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, I do agree that it's not only about treating, but preventing. So I think we should really tackle food system and nutrition as a link to and affecting our daily life. So now I would like to welcome Reem on the stage, um, which is one of the members of the MENA Youth Network. So thank you so much for being there today. You're a youth activist, so can you tell us a bit more what the power of youth could be when it comes to healthy food systems, especially in your region? Thank you very much, Juliet. So we have many, many young people in our region, Middle East and North Africa. I'm from Iraq. And just to introduce myself, I'm Reema Safar. I'm executive director of the United Network and also head of the Iraqi delegation to COP27. The Iraqi youth delegation, I'm so sorry, to, to COP27. Oh, wow, no, <laughs> I'm not that, that cool yet. All right. Um, so around more than 28% of the population of the MENA region is, is made up of people from 15 to 29 years old. That is, that is around 108 million people. 108 million people can do a lot of things now and in the future. And we need to make sure that we train them well to be able to do these things. Now, one thing I realize, and many young people real realize as well, is there is a disconnect between the young people and their governments. Um, young people in this generation have even less trust in their own governments than their, than their parents in the past generations. And I think that is a very, very big problem, and it relates to all different sectors, including food and agriculture. And so how do we tackle this problem? We, wanna, we need to build and open avenues of communication between these youth and their governments, their leaders, show them that they could work together to accomplish um, and find solutions. And another thing is within the food sector in the MENA region, our 
I would say our, our levels of, of agriculture are going down. One is also because water scarcity in many different countries in Iraq, we have horrible, horrible um, problems in water scarcity, not just climate change, it also relates to, you know, uh, resource management problems, political uh, problems where there's other countries gatekeeping our water supply from the rivers. Um, and so all of these also relate to policy negotiations. How do we reason with our neighbors to, to share these resources that we live together on this planet and, and that we all need to be able to access these resources. But when this happens, rural communities who are usually the communities that are always, uh, not always, but the communities that are most um, involved with agriculture, um, they are not supported enough in our region. And so when there's no support young people, especially young people, and now their parents as well, are starting to, to leave their jobs, to leave their occupations that they've been doing for generations. Did it start? Okay. And moving to the cities to find better job opportunities. And so we need to support young people and change the notion that agriculture or being a farmer is equals to poverty. Because it shouldn't mean that. Farmers are the ones who are the people who give us life. They they make they grow the food, and they are the ones who feed us. And so we need to reinvent the notion of farmers and of agriculture as more of an entrepreneurial endeavor. Um, to market it as something that's more uh, attractive to younger people to go into. And so what one thing we can do, for example. Rural areas really need better education. We have we have a very good ac access rate to education in our region, so we have access to education, but we have very low quality of education. So although you have free schools, free universities in many countries, the education quality is not as high. Is it okay? That's good. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> all right. Um, so so. Education, and, and we also don't want young people to have to leave their communities to access this education. So, for example, having vocational schools in these rural areas that focus on the occupations that yo these young people would most likely pursue within their local area. Um, in regards to gender as well, in the MENA region and all over the world, women are very disproportionately affected, negatively affected by the climate crisis. And, and okay, and by the 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 worsening of the conditions in agriculture, um, including water security. Many different countries, women have to leave their their schooling or leave their uh, you know leave their their careers, or ha or are not even expected to have the schooling or careers to help with getting water from from farther places or to help with. Um, with, with the, the, the field work that is going on. So if we can provide these people with better resources, better technology, better um, is that working? Okay. Of their agricultural resources, we can solve many, many different issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Im. And I hope this microphone will last as long as our presentation. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny though that we keep hearing that there is a disconnect between young people and governments because I don't see much of change right now. Is there anyone from a government in the, in the room? Well, thank you for coming. <laughs> so this is an example. Uh, I hope you will tell your colleague to, to go next time. Anyway, thank you Rim so much. Uh, we'll go now to Cecilia, who is representing Otley. Otley is also very engaged when the goal is to empower children and young people. So, like you have for the EU school uh, scheme, also a campaign uh, where you advocate for more plant-based. So, could you maybe enlighten us a little bit on the role of the private sector? And yeah, because I think you have a major role to play. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting uh, me. And I must start off saying thank you. And thank you for that uh, initial. I mean, it's like 
music to my ears listening to you. I mean, it's really what we need. I couldn't, I, I'm signing up to everything. It's all science-based. We know what we, it needs to happen. So what I find interesting, so Oatly is a company, who, a Swedish company, uh, who uh, with the mission we have is to facilitate conversion from traditional animal-based dairy to plant-based drinks and preferably ours, of course. Uh, but what I find intriguing is that now we have a development and situation where we have young people, we have NGOs, and we have business going hand in hand, whereas governments are lagging behind. Isn't that interesting? And we have all those facts. I mean, I was sitting here, I have those data I was going to read out here. It was like, check, 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 check. Very nice. I appreciate that. So what can we do uh, as business? Of course, one thing is, of course, to provide products to help this shift happening. One thing when it comes to the Eat Lancet report, which we heard uh, references to here before, and I fully agree, I think it's a fantastic recommendation. Go home and compare your dietary guidelines. We have done that mapping. And when it comes to Eat Lancet, I think one, I think the report is fantastic, but one, m one thing I'm missing there is actually the alternatives to the plant-based options to traditional meat and dairy. They are not part of there. I mean, so our products would count as grains. Nobody thinks of our products as grains, right? So, so I think that is important to take into consideration when we're take, thinking about what should the dietary guidelines look like. Uh, so that is one point I want to make. Uh, Juliet, do you want me to now tell everything we want to do? Shall I go? Shall I just shoot? I have so much to tell. So, uh, so what, what I think we can do and what we have done, we have gone hand in hand with uh, many, uh, many consumers. So we know, like you mentioned, Juliet, we know that there are so many barriers in place hindering the transition to ha happening. Lots of subsidies. Uh, I know that Marco Springman, he has done a report on mapping all those subsidies globally, globally, which are locking farmers into this industrialized animal farming structure, which is quite interesting to dive into. So I would really recommend you to look into that. One very concrete uh, such measure uh, which many of us have been programmed with uh, are, is the school milk scheme. That's a uh, worldwide scheme, even though it's interesting that the majority of the world's population suffer from lactose intolerance. Isn't that interesting? Is that not interesting? And so the EU is now reviewing its scheme to support uh, schools and we are asking to at least include plant-based drinks on the same conditions as milk. And there is resistance against that. And I know, and I've heard so many examples given where I work, of people who have been forced to, to show a medical certificate to have an alternative to traditional uh, milk. And also it's interesting, if you read the preamble to the legislation, it says that the school milk subsidy is there in order to promote long-term production and consumption of milk because, and it should be served to school, school children because that's when tr taste preferences are being set. Isn't that interesting? And also the legislation is also linked to a, de a condition that the schools need to have educational measures on the products. So they need to educate the children on how to drink milk and how milk is produced and so forth. We need to, so it's really norm setting. So we need to put things in place, incentives, subsidies and so forth that actually help the transformation to happen. So, um, so uh, that, that is a really concrete example of what we're doing and uh, where we uh, now have a petition. I would invite you to sign that petition together with ProVeg on a school milk scheme. Yes, right, Juliette? We want you to, we want you all to sign that and uh, share, share the, a call to action there. And also, uh, we've also had a petition on mandatory climate footprint. We think that price is not guiding consumers right. So we started putting the climate footprint of our products onto the products on pack. And we've asked governments to make it a mandatory uh, law to have that because we think the price can be really misguiding because you do haven't 
the price doesn't internalize the externalities, as you say. We, it doesn't represent the real cost of the product. Uh, so we think that is missing. And we also ran a petition, also attracted l with the help of young people in Germany, which actually la landed us in the Bundestag, where we could make a presentation and where we were asking for this mandatory climate footprint uh, labeling. And to be transparent, to empower consumers to make informed choices, also incentivize the industry to reduce their climate impact, right? There are so many positive things about it. Um, a couple of other examples I want, can I, can I take a couple of more minutes? You stop me, Juliet, because I mean, it's more interesting to listening to you guys, of course. Is it okay? Uh, so a couple of more um, examples of those distortions are VAT or tax. So milk is exempted from tax in many countries or lower tax than their plant-based alternatives, which is also very weird. That's a, yet another like barrier uh, which is distorting market con uh, um, conditions. Choop. And also uh, another one is how we are allowed to describe products. That sounds like ridiculous, but actually, so for instance, there was an initiative which we managed to, to stop again, thanks to consumers and petitions, uh, was that we were not allowed to describe our products in any way that could reference dairy. So we wouldn't be able to say, use like cooking cream, for instance, which becomes ridiculous because that's yet another way of trying to to, and this we can see in many countries worldwide, this is happening now, where there are lobby efforts to stop uh, plant-based options to describe themselves in a way to be understood. It must be easy to converse and to, to replace the traditional, uh, tra tra traditional products. So to, so to finish off, we have a call to action. So to all of you, we invite you, of course, to sign the petition, but we have a, have a call to action. And uh, two policymakers that we would like to uh, announce here is, first of all, we're asking, of course, that food is part of the national climate plans. That must be it, and it must be part. And there is like this methane pledge, pledge that was introduced last year. Of course, it should also cover livestock and emissions from the agriculture sector, right, or food sector. But we were asking is advanced scientific research, education, and awareness on health and climate impacts of food. Exactly what we heard here earlier, which I think is beautiful. Awareness and education, that is key, always key. Two, set policies that promote a shift to plant-centric sustainable food systems. That's very important. Remove policy barriers and market distortions that prevent the level playing field um, for more sustainable plant-based options. And this includes such as outdated dietary guidelines, imbalanced trade rules, promotion schemes, denominations, standards of identity, and taxes and subsidies favoring high polluting livestock sectors, because that's where we are today. I, I only mentioned a couple of examples uh, here. We want uh, to have, as I mentioned, ensure national methane policies include reduction, reduction and mitigation of emissions from the food sector. Invest in farmers and entrepreneurs by providing financial and te technical support for sustainable farming practices. There is willingness, but there are lock-in mechanisms now, which is a barrier for transition. Expand equitable, equitable access to healthy, sustainable foods in uh, schools, public catering programs, and so forth, and empower consumers to make sustainable food choices, such as through climate footprint labeling, and also hold food companies accountable with regulatory standards. We need to build and evolve. So thank you. I was very, I had very many words to say there. Thank you for patience and listening to this. Who next? Thanks, Cecilia. This is a yeah, labeling and marketing standards are really important, especially when it comes to plant-based food. But I really do like the idea of carbon footprint for, yeah, for food. <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, we should know the real cost of food. It's not only like euro or dollar or whatever. It's also environmental. Anyway, thank you for that. Uh, there's also something we usually don't really talk about in this conversation especially at COP, uh, it's faith and culture. So Steve, you're an expert on these topics and would like to ask you, what's the link with food and health? Thanks so much, Julia, and hi, everyone. So I'm um, Steve Chu, Buddhist City Foundation. Our mandate is to serve with compassion in action. 
We're a humanitarian aid organization working across all 17 SDGs, really with the idea that like through empowering local communities, we find sustainability. And so with this conversation and the previous conversation with our colleagues at IMFSA, I think we can draw a lot of inspiration to like the idea that technical solutions exist, right? We're reducing barriers to entry for from the private sector side. We're really lifting up the awareness that there are challenges that face us right now. And we know that there's health benefits to shifting our food systems. So the question becomes, why haven't we taken action, why are things still stagnating, and why are things not changing? And so from my side, representing a faith-based organization, we've really centered on this question from the space of values. How do we reorient our relationship with our food system through the realignment of our values? Exploring what anchors and grounds us amidst the sea of noise, right? So for example, um, we really want to look at what we are uh, approaching these actions as a society, are we perpetuating these cycles of extraction, um, exploitation, and discarding people within the food systems, or are we really looking to regenerate um, and empower those that exist in our food systems? And so our call to action, first and foremost, is always how can we better work with faith-based organizations that are values aligned, right? Not just any faith-based organization, but those who are really on the ground taking action and then integrating these values of interdependence, truth, reverence, respect, compassion into the work that we're doing uh, as we transform our food systems. Because what we're recognizing is that culture is very much something that is immaterial, right? Like there's this material lens of like, we have the food, we know we, our food needs to change, but then there's the immaterial, which is like, what inspires us and what are the narratives and stories that we tell ourselves about how this transition will happen? Because we know that the transition will occur, it's just this question of will it be a just transition? And so reorienting our food, our relationship with food through this values uh, and integrating values in our decision-making structures has been some of the ways that we've really seen success as we do this work across 120 some countries um, where we really empower communities to have agency and sovereignty over their own food system and re-examine their own relationship with the food right is this food that we're consuming something that really breathes into our health and like helps me have a better future with my family or is this really just perpetuating cycles of like um, fast food junk food and then like diving into like this uh, illusion of a dream that by eating more of these things I will be healthier while poisoning the planet um, so I'll close with three thoughts just because I'm loving this conversation and want to hold time for more dialogue but the first is really I think in our conversation so far I've really felt this resonance of what does it mean to invite people to the struggle where it's like we need to change our food systems and it's challenging, right? But that's a struggle. Yeah, I'm, I'm a busy guy, I'm suffering every day. Like I don't have time to like do more things, right? Versus if you're inviting people to the party, it's a very different uh, lens, right? And so integrating uh, the values with this spirit of joy and process as we do this work really allows for more space for people to feel like they can participate in this, right? Because the gap of youth and governments is not just one where like youth are uh, responding and governments are not listening, but rather sometimes that sense of like perfection of wanting to get the right message before you go somewhere is so overbearing that it becomes a struggle rather than um, something joyous and playful. Um, and then really we have to transform our narrative of what it means to be in relationship with each other, our planet, and our food systems. Mm. Thanks so much, Steve. Sounds like we are only human after all, and that values connect people as much as food. So that's nice. So finally, I would like to welcome Mac Lawrence from MasterCorp Zimbabwe to talk to us a bit more about the food security challenges also linked to this topic. Okay, thank you. So my name is McLarence uh, from Zimbabwe. I work uh, with Mexico. Uh, Mexico is a global organization uh, in over 42 countries. Uh, we work with people in crisis. Uh, we also have uh, a nexus of climate change uh, and uh, vulnerability, especially on food security. So it's very, very important to join this conversation about uh, food for health and sustainability. Uh, it's becoming a topical issue around the world. I'm sure we all acknowledge that um, uh, between 2030 to 2050, there will be 250,000 additional deaths that will be caused by the climate crisis that is linked to health. And I was also glad that um, 3 billion people currently 
they do not have access to a nutritious diet, which is quite worrying. So when we talk of food availability, food affordability, in relation to food security, we really need to look at this from a broader and sectoral perspective. So many times when you talk of food security, we are often referring to food availability. So it is very, very important, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, in Asia, where vulnerability to food security is increasing, uh, to take into consideration the policies that will actually make sure that the nutrition factor uh, is integrated. We know that climate change is increasing uh, diseases, Floods, for example, in Zimbabwe caused a boom in diarrhea diseases uh, when we experienced cyclone Idai. Uh, school children are denied uh, the right to education uh, and a lot of health implications are involved. So this all goes back to the police perspective uh, that will be available from the local uh, to the national level. So it's very, very important for us to understand the broader definition of food security that it really includes nutrition. So during this COP27, I was glad to join conversations about agriculture. And it's quite encouraging to see that um, the negotiators, uh, experts, and our policymakers, they are increasingly recognizing that food security is not only about availability, uh, but it's also about affordability, accessibility, and also nutrition. So within Mexico, we have a broader uh, humanitarian interventions that we also implement. For example, if we are distributing food, if we are providing agriculture support, we just do not distribute food, but we make sure that uh, the vouchers that we distribute food uh, there's an element uh, of nutrition that is involved. It's very, very important uh, to make sure that uh, the aspects uh, of health and climate change are integrated. Uh, we know that we are promoting uh, drought-tolerant maize varieties, uh, traditional grains, uh, small grains, ETC, that are more adapted to climate change. But there's more to it that uh, we often promote um, biofortified seeds, uh, which you know that they may contain zinc, for example, uh, which is also going to aid uh, into the nutrition. So there's need for a broader programming, especially from a humanitarian perspective, uh, in taking into cognizance that in as much as we are adapting to climate change, but for us to build full community resilience, especially at grassroots level, there's need really to integrate uh, nutrition, uh, and also the health issues that are being caused by climate change. So one of the asks that we often have is that uh, in so many organizations and governments, we really do not have uh, health or nutrition focal points. So it's very, very important for us to be having nutrition or health focal points uh, in as far as uh, climate change conversations are concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would say healthy plate, healthy planet. <laughs> That's also uh, almost the title on one of our day on the Food for Climate Pavilion next week. Yes, small self-promotion. Anyway, thank you very much to all. We have another bit of time for questions, so feel free to raise your hand and uh, ask any question you want. And I will do the... Okay, thank you. Thank you for the panelists and the prisoners. Even more, we are connected with the youth. That just to be sure that the governments, of course, they are take care for the youth and the issues related to the climate change, because there is no way anyone away from the climate change impact. And that's what we agreed to be on the same point, to be aligning on the same line. But here, if we are talking about the education, what sometimes I hear that the education how to be enough. How can you evaluate the enough education to learn what about the climate change impact? So the basic practicing, I suppose, and here we should exchange our experience due to the uh, communications, due to the type of the learning that we are seeking before uh, climate change and 
after the happening of the climate change. And you know, it's, we are, I suppose, we reach the tip point for the climate impact, especially in my country, Iraq. We suffered from different type of uh, impacts. I suppose it's adverse impact of the climate change represented by the droughts, displaced people from the marshlands. Even more, the, we are reduce our uh, production on the agriculture level. So here's many impacts represented by different areas around the world and what is the type of the education. I suppose what um, uh, Ms. Reem Asafar and uh, Mr. I don't remember your name, so sorry, but you know, here we are talking about the connectivity between the governments and the youth, and even more, we are talking about the base technical implementation to be deployed as a national circumstances that can accept this type of newism, of modern technologies, of how to deal with the uh, issues related to the climate change impact. Even more, we are seeking for the resilience youth, not to be just, sometimes I, I, I suppose they are very aggressive in their uh, opinions. Yes, that's good to raise your sound, the sound of youth, but I suppose more resilience that we are need on the government level and on the youth level, there it will be a good connectivity between each other. Even more, what is the adverse impact due to the health, especially? You know, many diseases that after the climate change impact, even more the coronavirus, one of the viruses that impact all around the world, impacted by the coronavirus, and how to make the green recovery. I suppose the best learning from the past to the future, it's about what is the type of re green to greening our economies. What is the type of the technology that we are trying to evaluate and then assess, then decide what is the type of the decisions, what is the level of the decisions on the government or the youth. And even more, the youth are always seeking to put their hand on the type of the decisions. But you know, if you are away from the knowledge of the climate change science, and then you try to put your hand on the decisions, I suppose it will be mess. But the knowledge and the level of the knowledge, that's what will decide, yes, you can put your hand to write your decision with the governments. The governments always should focus and highlight on the type of the provisional agenda, submissions, negotiations, but even more, they are very eager, keen, seeking to reach the goals of their national. So I suppose we are the connectivity and seeking the connectivity between the government and youth depend on your knowledge and what I should be get on the ra raising on the table, put all the topics, yes, you should focus on that type of topics related to the climate change, and then you put the science and knowledge on the issues related to the those topics or this, these issues, and then yes, you can write the decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone wants to react on this uh, intervention? I love this. Thanks so much for the question. So I'll, I'll frame this in four pieces. The first being, what technologies exist that help us cultivate um, like this better linkage between youth, governments, and food systems? So the first thing that Siji does, um, no matter what community we go to, is we first find like local community groups, right? And that what we found as a sustainable intervention for any work that we do is mobilizing and empowering local communities because we build power through creating connections, right? So in the sense of like what it means to like draw these links in a stronger way it's about the question of do, do we have capacity to reach out to existing youth groups that are working on the ground if we do how do we bring them in right and I, I also want to lift up this 
thought of like dissolving silos, right? Like we can kind of see that like the health, sustainability, and youth spaces, they kind of all work in their own ways. And sometimes they can be a little like siloed, right? And so what structures can we create that allow for that better communications? Which is why um, like my intervention started with the question of values, right? If we honor and we really center the value of interconnectivity within the way we're designing our structures of how we're engaging with youth, then we know we have to dissolve silos in order to begin to take action. If there are silos, then we find ourselves in problematic spaces. Um, second thing around like education not being enough and the need for implementation. I love this, uh, this reflection that we have in Siji that goes something along the lines of like anyone can like gain knowledge, right? But you need to take action uh, in order to have that become wisdom. Right, and so one of the challenges that I think young people have is time poverty and an overall lack of opportunity to really take action, right? Like we're bombarded by all of this news, this information that um, like our food systems are failing us. Um, what are the actions that we can really take? How much agency do we have, right? So as a government uh, agency, what is the way that we can facilitate more youth to begin to take action so that the knowledge becomes wisdom? And once they get it, then they, they're a self perpetuating machine and they're going right but that initial kickstart I think relying on uh, government resourcing is a fantastic way to like boost communities into like a more pro progressive space um, and then I think finally just uh, thinking about resilience uh, we really find that resilience is found within ourselves and the communities that we build right and so the more we're able to facilitate authentic connection with each other in like steeped in these values that we hold and share together even if we have differences um, in terms of like how these values are manifested right we know that by having this community together we can weather any storm that climate change puts up to us because we recognize that we are interconnected and if one person is suffering everyone is suffering thanks for the question and just to add on the entire, I mean, amazing, amazing uh, explanation. Thank you very much. But uh, to answer Mr. Mustafa's question, and thank you very much for attending the session. The entire reason they're here is to support me uh, <laughs> uh, as part of the delegation. Um, I'm, I, you know, when you want to reach out to young people, and I'm talking from a regional perspective, um, many of my colleagues don't have what I have. And so the reason I'm here is because my government reached out to me and they're listening to me. And, and we can talk about, we can, we can discuss and talk about how to engage other young people locally. Because I have this privilege of being in this space, being here, being able to negotiate for other young people. But these spaces ha are, have not yet been built. We need to talk, we need to discuss, and we need to f find the best ways to build these spaces, to make sure that young people are, are involved and they're invo and not disproportionately involved, they're being fairly um, involved as a demographic as well. Because even if you, you can get any young person from any country and say, here, we have representation, but you need to make sure that the representation, that you gave as many people as possible the chance to be represented. Um, and in regards to education as well, there are many uh, metrics for measuring uh, the, the levels of education around the world. Um, there are exams, there, there are, um, m you know, research that is going on to measure each country's um, level of education. And, but, and this is something that is universal in every single country in the world where education is, has become a business. Uh, you have to pay more to access better education and I don't believe that this is um, humane in any sort of way because every single person, no matter their culture, no matter their background or their financial situation, deserves to have good quality education because when you give that, you just get back. As a country, if you give everybody a good level of education, you get back so much more when it comes to, um, you know, innovation, people being more creative and innovative in their work, and also there are statistics that show that higher levels of education equal to better economies. Um, and so, yeah, that was it, but thank you uh, to my delegation for showing up here, and I feel your support. Um, and I hope that this shows to other countries 
the importance of supporting your own youth um, in these spaces and in their localities as well. Thank you. Just wanted to add something because this this is very inspiring. I'm happy that Reem is here on behalf of Iraq as well. So that's nice, and it's very important also to learn about this because what I have seen l last night it was yesterday or the day before when they agreed actually on the ACE document within the negotiations. I remember on the 9th of November there was a text about having a national focal point from the youth, about having youth into delegations of international conferences, and then on the 11th of November. I can't see this anymore on the text that they agreed upon, or somehow things were changing, the text was changed to be more general rather than to be more specific. So I guess it's very important to learn from such experiences. And I also guess it's also important that also delegates like Reem would speak even in other opportunities with other parties and even on site in the negotiation rooms, telling them that we need more youth inside to be able to speak. For example, what we're speaking about today is very relevant to the Cornelia Joint Work on Agriculture. However, we cannot be inside. We cannot be even speaking regarding like what do we need in the text, although it should be or like the text should be reflecting the needs of the parties, of the observers, of everyone who is present in the COP and even the people outside COP. So I guess such examples should be very much reflected, should be very much learned from. And it's very important also for the negotiation and the text to be more specific regarding actually what we need and how it will be implemented. Because commitments are easy to make, but the implementation or the actions, that's why we're having 27 COPs and we're going to the 28th, because we have been making documents but not doing enough about implementation. But there is some implementation here, so yeah. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, we don't have uh, much more time. I mean, we don't have time anymore. <laughs> so we're going to end here. Uh, some of us are at the Food for Climate Pavilion, if you want to come uh, and see us. Uh, because, yeah, someone stole my business card. So if you want to connect, you need to go there. <laughs> and thank you to the panelists. It was really a really nice conversation. And yeah, that's it. <laughs>